Okay, welcome everyone to the April 7th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. It is 9 a.m. and we will begin our meeting with a roll call. Commissioner Bertrand. Present. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Uh, here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commission alternate at uh, first. I'm here. Commission Alternate Hernandez. Commissioner Hernandez or Commissioner Caput. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Friend. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. You're muted, Kristen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm present. I'm here. Commissioner Parker. Present. Commissioner Rockin. Here. You have a quorum. All right. Thank you. So we will now take oral communications. Oral communications is a time for any member of the public to address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that's not on today's agenda. And the commission will listen to all communications, but in compliance with state law, may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. So speakers are asked to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded <laughs> excuse me, in the minutes of the meeting. And uh, in order to uh, raise your hand, you want to press that raise hand button on your uh, computer on Zoom or press star six, star nine, star nine to raise your hand. <laughs> uh, the community TV, it looks like we're still in practice um, session and I don't see that the attendees have been let in. Oh, excuse me. I don't see any either. Okay. So we'll give that a moment to here we go. Bring folks in. You may not have heard your announcement, yeah, Sandy. I'll, I'll do that again. Sorry about that, Commissioner Brown. No worries. Okay. So this is uh for members of the public who are just being admitted to the meeting. Uh, we are now on oral communications, uh, and as um, per usual, any uh, member of the public can address the commission on items uh, on, that are not on today's agenda during oral communications, and um, you can indicate your interest in speaking by raising your hand, and I see hands are going up. We'll start with Brian from Trail Now. Brian from Trail Now, you are up and it looks like you're muted. Yes, in a hospital room. Brian Peoples, thank you. Um, I'm calling you today from the IC unit in Reno. Um, I'm okay. I broke my neck skiing uh, and uh, fractured nine ribs. The reason I'm calling in today is just to talk about the importance of opening the coastal trail because people here were hurt and miss the, the one factor that is stopping the trail from being open is Miss Clark, the private owner of Roaring Camp. And it is so important for her to get the message that she can't as a private citizen, the owner of a business, prevent our community from having the trail. So I ask you all, please reach out to Ms. Clark and say it's wrong for her to stop our community from getting that trail open and saving lives. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. 
Um, I and I hope you uh, are in good have, getting good care and that you have a speedy recovery. Um, thanks for your comments. Okay, uh, next up we have Michael Saint. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Brown, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. I'd like to ask you all a question. What is the most effective actions individuals can take to conserve energy? The answer to that is public transportation. By eliminating one car and taking public transit instead, you will eliminate 30% of your CO2 emissions. Why isn't this happening uh, here in Santa Cruz? County or America in general, and why in Europe, Asia, and Canada, their public transportation is two to five times greater per capita and thus giving them a much higher ridership. The reason European, Asian, Canadian cities treat public transportation as a vital public utility. Most American policymakers, which includes RTC as well as Metro, and voters see transit as a social welfare program. Program. Our excuse of saying our suburban sprawl, our rural areas are not conducive to public transit is a cop-out. Canada is much more rural than the US and historically other countries combine suburbs and rural areas with better transit. We need to uh, foster good public transportation by pushing people from their cars uh, by discouraging driving, eliminate fuel subsidies, higher charges for automobile ownership and use, and use the revenues from those charges to enhance a sustainable urban and suburban transport system. We need to pull people to transit. How do we do that? Provide good quality of service, develop infrastructure for transit, and non-motorized -motor transit. Without an emphasis on transit, congestion, greenhouse gas emissions and car usage will continue to climb. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saints. Uh, the next speaker is Trink Praxel. And it looks like Ms. Praxel has dropped off. Okay, so while we're waiting for Ms. Praxel to, oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wasn't getting the unmute button. <laughs> um, great. I, I sent um, an email letter to um, the commission and to other county agency administrators yesterday, and I'm not sure all commissioners got to read it, so I wanted to raise it in oral communications. We have a kind of urgent problem uh, regarding the Measure D campaign. Um, the old signs from the 2016 Measure D camp, uh, not the campaign, but after Measure D was successfully passed, the Regional Transportation Commission actually sent out vehicle stickers to many local agencies to have to have them show appreciation for the funding support that came from Measure D. But that signage is still in use on some public agency vehicles now. And this is very confusing to people because a, a very similar slogan is being used now in the 2022 Measure D campaign as was used in 2016. In 22, it's now move forward now. In 2016, it was moving Santa Cruz County forward. Some similarities in colors and fonts really make it appear as if these two are related. And it is already confusing to people in the public about these two Measure D campaigns and how they're related. But of course, a yes vote is very different from one to the other. And I really ask the RTC to work with their with the other public agencies that still have um, these signs up and get them down immediately or covered. I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Praxel. Okay, our next caller is Barry Scott. <clears throat> and Mr. Scott, you are on mute. 
Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I was happy to uh, participate in the last night's uh, open house on the uh, trail segments 10 and 11. And, and I remember too that last week was uh, trail segments eight and nine. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm calling because I, I can't for the life of me understand why we're looking at um, the alternatives. I understand how CEQA works. I understand we have to look at reasonable alternatives, but I wonder if the commissioners and the public really realize that the interim trail approach, uh, which is we're told expected to lead to the ultimate trail, which is basically the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail design, rail and trail. I don't know why we're why we're looking at what is truly infeasible, expensive, and inconsistent with all of the plans up till till now. I I was surprised to learn that the interim trail and the idea of, for those not familiar, the alternative that's being investigated is to take the tracks out, build a trail, later on take the trail out, put the tracks back, and then build the trail again, which is coming in at almost twice the cost. And for those segments I mentioned, 9, 10, and 11, a little more than six miles, the cost of this alternative is 60 grand, 60 million for, for doing something that can't even be done. I wonder why we're looking at something that would require rail banking when rail banking is unlikely. I wonder why we're looking at something that would terribly harm Roaring Camp. And, and, I, and I hope that all of our commissioners who vote, obviously, will uh, pay close attention to the details. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, next up, we have Sally Arnold for Rail and Trail. Thank you for uh, um, for all your service, everybody on, on the RTC. I know it's all very complicated, and I want to uh, just uh, add on and echo what uh, Trink Praxel was saying about this confusion with the signs. It's really, um, it, it, it gives the appearance that County Department of Public Works, trucks and buses and other things are actually campaigning for the current Measure D. And it's, um, um, I know that, I mean, it's no secret to people in this meeting that, you know, I've been working um, on, on this campaign, but we're getting calls and texts from people, you know, sending photos saying, it's terrible that, the, that you know, the Public Works is campaigning on this issue. Are they allowed to do that? And, you know, and we're trying to calm people down and say, no, it's a different Measure D, but people, the, the community's getting riled up. And um, and it's unfortunate that, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to see people, you know, I don't want to see voters, un, you know, angry at the RTC, who's got that 2016 Measure D logo on the website, angry at the various city DPWs and the county DPW, angry at Metro, angry at Liftline, all the various places where that 2016 sign is up right now. Um, you know, those agencies are just inviting the anger of voters unnecessarily. And, you know, the anger of voters who, who are savvy enough to recognize that it looks like campaigning and just other voters who are kind of innocent and don't understand that agencies aren't supposed to campaign and just think, oh, I guess my local streets people like this measure, I should vote for it. It's a, it's a mess. It's just a confusing mess, and it really needs to be addressed ASAP as the election season hits up, heats up. And I just want to thank you all for really taking this problem seriously and addressing it immediately. Because the longer you wait, the bigger a mess this is going to become. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. Our next speaker is Lonnie Faulkner. Hi, thank you so much, Chair Brown. Um, I too am very concerned to see publicly owned vehicles, including the bus Metro. I was just shocked to see the posters on the back of public works vehicles and county buildings and other projects throughout the community promoting ballot measure D. Um, and I just wanna echo what Sally said that these, um, these posters need to either be covered or removed through this uh, election season. It's very confusing. 
um, using our public funds to promote the local ballot measures not acceptable and the appearance of that is not acceptable and all these signs um, should be removed immediately. I'm sure you're aware that Measure D is a highly controversial topic right now and so um, local voters need to not be confused about that. Um, I just also want to mention, I'm shocked and disappointed that Brian Peoples or any member of this community would lay blame for holding up our trail on our beloved family-owned business, Roaring Camp, and Melanie, Melanie Clark, the CEO of a 64-year-old family business that brings so much happiness and money to Santa Cruz County. Um, not to mention the fact that Roaring Camp is incredibly generous, giving back to the community in so many ways, um, whereas I find that some other organizations are more uh, takers, Roaring Camp is a giving community. Um, there have been ongoing attempts, I find it ironic, by both Brian Peoples and another organization uh, that's running the Measure D who have been targeting Roaring Camp in order to destroy the Felton branch line, um, in order to attack and destroy our own publicly owned rail line, the Santa Cruz branch line. These attacks have served to stall and jeopardize bringing the already approved Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail to our coastal rail or coastal rail to our community as quickly as possible and not only threaten the construction of our trail, but also our equitable, environmentally wise electric light rail that we've been working on for over a decade. I, I do hope that Brian heals quickly from his devastating injuries, um, but just wanted to put that uh, to task about his accusation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Our next speaker is David Loves Public Transit. Uh, uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, first um, to Brian, I hope you're doing okay and recover well. You know, uh, obviously, I think you're sometimes kind of loony, but we are colleagues in transit advocacy, and I certainly hope the best for one of our own. Um, so to reiterate Trink's point about measure D confusion, I, I literally did hear from someone who asked me because, you know, gosh, I'm the local expert. Um, they said, didn't we already vote on this? So it's it's a real thing. And um, also on the website, there's a link that just says Measure D, which should probably get the full name like 2016 Transportation Sales Tax Measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. <laughs> okay, it. I don't see any additional hands up. So I'm going to give a last call for oral communications. This is for items not on today's agenda. And seeing no additional hands coming up. Um, Commissioner Fern. Oh, uh, yes, Commissioner Schifrin. Sorry. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I, I would like to ask staff to provide the commission with a report on the legality of uh, public agencies appearing to advocate or advocating for ballot measures. I think the concerns raised by members of the public regarding confusion over Measure D um, signs on public um, in, in public places uh, needs to be taken seriously, and so. Um, I know in the past it's been a real issue where um, public agencies can provide information, but they really can't advocate. And I think while um, I know none of this is happening on purpose um, in terms of um, the, what the public agencies are doing, I do think that unfortunately having the same letter for this for the greenway ballot measure as was for the sales tax measure is unfortunate and I wonder whether um, the, it would be you know whether something needs to be done in order to avoid an illegal uh, violation of the elections code. So I'd appreciate it if we get maybe get a report from our attorney. Uh, on the next agenda to um, regarding this matter. Madam Chair, we can provide that report. Great. Yeah, that would that would be helpful. I'll I'll say that I too have heard from community members uh, who are uh, genuinely con confused, not calling to suggest that um, there's some kind of um, something that's um, untoward going on, but there is confusion. And I think that um, 
kind of resolving that is is important. So getting that report would be very helpful. Um, I, I'm just going to also say, and then I'll turn, I see that uh, Commissioner McPherson has a hand up and Commissioner Rock can, um, but, uh, you know, also for members of the public who are concerned, uh, it's probably worth communicating with your local agencies, your city councils and, and the county board of supervisors um, who are, um, you know, have the have vehicles that are, you know, potentially in this situation. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I, I I wonder if um, we could speed this up. Uh, I mean, the, the election is in June, this is April, uh, and it's before us. I, I don't know if um, council, is there any way we could speed up an opinion on that uh, of some yes. type? Yeah, yeah, uh, Super uh, Commissioner, we can. Um, there are very specific restrictions on the issues. This issue is obviously a little complicated because it's two separate measures, but we can advise the staff and the commissioners very quickly on this issue and, and coordinate with the other agencies as necessary. Uh, great. Um, well, I, I, as soon as possible would be really great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, Commissioner Rockin. So my point would be, I, I don't think there's a legal confusion about, you know, would it be all right for people to, uh, agencies to endorse a public you know, measure that's on the ballot? The issue really is um, getting this, these signs down fairly quickly. Since the RTC sent these out, and we, all of us, Bruce and McPherson leading the charge, and me, me not far behind him, thanking the public over and over again for voting for Measure D in 2016, because the funding that it provided for public transit of all different kinds and bike and paths and stuff, it's not just vehicles. Uh, every time you see a new project, you know, for a path or a bike path or something else, there's a thank you for Measure D funding um, sign up there and stuff. So I think since the RTC sent these out uh, and people are using our logos and stuff for it, maybe we, we could, I'll leave it to staff. We can't take an action on this, but the staff can act on this just to send a simple message to all the various agencies or transit, transportation agencies that we're in contact with, uh, noting this problem and asking them to you know, remove the signs until after June. They could go back. I hope they would go back up again, no matter what happens on the Measure D, the current Measure D. Um, but I think we should not wait for a legal opinion in a month. I think we should just have staff send something out, point out the problem, and asking people to cover up and take down these signs. <clears throat> again, I don't think we can take a motion or an action on it because it's on the uh, it was on the you know oral communication the issue came up. But but the staff can act on this certainly. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. And and I will also follow up <clears throat> with the staff on this. I've I've already talked with um, the city of Santa Cruz about it, and um, so other commissioners. Um, if you want to talk with your respective staffs as well, now that we've been alerted to it, um, that seems appropriate. Okay, thank you uh, for the follow up, and thanks to our. Uh, commenters, I'll ask now, if, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda today? Madam Chair, no, we do not. All right, thank you. We'll now move on to our consent agenda. Uh, all items on the consent agenda, this is items four through 18, uh, are, will uh, be acted on in one motion if no member of the RTC or the public wishes to uh, remove an item for discussion. Uh, you can, I can also ask for questions now. So if uh, members of the commission have questions, uh, you can ask those uh, without pulling an item. Um, but I'll ask first, do any commissioners have an item to pull from today's consent agenda? And are there any questions or comments on any item on the agenda? the consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, I will take it out to the public to ask if there are any comments from the public on items on our consent agenda. This is items four through 18. All right. Approve approval uh, of the consent agenda. We have okay. one. We have one hand has, um, has oh, oops, come up okay. from the, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the public. <laughs> um, so we'll, um, I'll go ahead and call on uh, Michael Saint. Mr. Saint, you're up. And then I'll take a motion. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. I'm just a little slow with my hands. Sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to offer a thank you. I know I come up here and speak quite a bit, and uh, some of it may seem negative or I'm always uh, pointing fingers, but uh, uh, item 17, I'm so happy that you guys are putting out this letter uh, to the state and Governor Newsom. Uh, it's about time we spoke up. It seems like we always want to throw money at an issue and to help support driving vehicles, lowering fuel um, costs at the pump and stuff like is, is the opposite that we should be doing. So thank you so much for that letter. Um, just wanted to offer um, my congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Now I'll make my motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second. And we, so we have a motion by Commissioner Rockton, second by Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, to approve our consent agenda. We'll now take a roll call vote on that. Commissioner Bertrand. I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hurst. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hernandez. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. I'm sorry, Commissioner Brown? Aye. <laughs> sorry. Commissioner Parker? Aye. Commissioner Brodkin? Aye. <laughs> and I also want to note that I did not include Commissioner Scott Eads at the beginning of the roll call. And he is here. <laughs> okay, so that motion passes uh, unanimously. We will now move on to our regular agenda and we will begin with commissioner reports. Any, any reports from commissioners? Uh, commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I'm, uh, I might be getting ahead of our director's report, but uh, an exciting thing is going to be happening between now and our next meeting, uh, Friday, April 29th at 9 a.m. I think it's still scheduled to have the grand opening of the wildlife undercrossing at Highway 17 at the Royal Curve. This is one of the carve outs in Measure D of 2016. Uh, a tremendous uh, project. Uh, we've seen it uh, underway for the last at least month or so, but uh, I just want to just uh, point out that I think it's still scheduled, unless I'm wrong, but April 29th. Friday at 9 a.m. Um, at the site. Really an exciting project. Yes, thank you, Commissioner McPherson. That is, it's very exciting and it's a, um, this is a great opportunity to celebrate our, uh, our successes. Absolutely. Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, I just wanted to report that last week, um, Chair Brown and I attended the Central Coast Coalition Sacramento Legislative Day. Um, so this is a coalition comprised of electeds and staff uh, from Santa Barbara, San Benito, San, uh, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Luis Obispo counties. Um, I should also note that um, we had members of RTC staff with us uh, as well, including Executive Director Preston. Um, we met with Governor Newsom's cabinet and legislative secretaries the chair of the California Transportation Commission, uh, Leanne Eager, the secretary of the California State Transportation Agency, Toko Mashakin, Senator Laird, uh, and Senator Limon from Santa Barbara, as well as Assemblymember Cunningham from the San Luis Obispo Santa Barbara area. And in general, our coalition message was to oppose a couple of state assembly bills that have been proposed that would uh, remove local control of transportation sales tax revenues. Um, it was also to explain that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to transportation improvements in the future um, and, uh, and VMT calculations, and that there some continued investment in auto infrastructure will be necessary on the Central Coast. Um, we also asked for our fair share when it comes to state money on active transportation and buses. What we heard was that the state will be investing in highway improvements, but they really want to see that these are multimodal projects that improve bus service and active transportation at the same time. And uh, hearing that, I, I was really realized how ahead of the curve our own uh, staff has been in positioning our projects uh, in just that light. 
Um, and I think a reflection of that, of course, is the $100 million plus that we got from the state in the last cycle um, for our uh, multimodal corridors project. But I also heard that uh, future awards are far from guaranteed because there's a lot of needs out there. For example, Santa Barbara is seeking state funding to complete their uh, high occupancy vehicle lane project. Pismo Beach is seeking state funding uh, on an HOV lane project. Monterey is seeking funding uh, for better safety on the 101 corridor, as well as to build rail down the Salinas Valley. San Benito wants money to improve Highway 25. Uh, and of course, we are seeking significant amount of funds for our future trail projects, metro and auxiliary lane projects. So while, we, as we've all heard, there is a lot of state and federal money available, I think we all need to be cognizant that there are a lot of demands on that money as well. I think 100 different communities could think of 100 ways to spend 100% of the money. And as we move forward and decide on what bus on shoulder and trail project we're going to apply for with segment 12, uh, I think we need to be conservative in our ask and conscientious of all the competing demands across the state. I mean, again, these were just the demands within our own coalition within the Central Coast region, which is relatively small within the state as a whole. Uh, so that is my report on that. Um, I also just want to use the opportunity to ask um, staff um, for some clarification, um, you know, we're on, on some of the issues with the Greenway Initiative. Um, we've, uh, you know, and my intent is not to argue one way or another for the initiative here, but just um, to get information. I don't know if it, uh, you know, for example, one question is, would passage of the Greenway Initiative prevent this commission from studying or pursuing funds for passenger rail if needed? Uh, and I can ask, I, I'm happy to send these questions to, um, you know, our legal counsel and executive director in the future if it's too difficult to answer now. But um, I do think it would be helpful for staff to clarify because um, I've seen a lot of different understandings on, on all sides of the issue and it would be helpful to have uh, the experts weigh in. Com Commissioner Koenig, I'm, I'm gonna ask that you, you do go ahead and thank you for uh, suggesting sending those questions in. Um, we are in entering into <laughs> territory that um, we probably ought not to enter into for Brown Act reasons. Um, because this is just commissioner report time. So um, if you could, I can, um, and I know that staff is, is very responsive and will follow up quickly. Um, and perhaps that can be part of the report back. Um, if we do have something on the, the May agenda, just to clarify what's happening with the signage, um, we could also include your quest responses to your questions, um, but they will be responsive to you. Um, so sure, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we I don't see any other hands up. So I think we will that will uh, that means that we'll move on now to our director's reports. And so I'll turn it over to Director Preston. Thank you, Madam Chair you. and Commissioners, members of the public. I have a few announcements today. Um, <laughs> First is regarding a funding presentation that was requested by uh, alternate commissioner, Jenny Johnson at the last RTC meeting. Uh, staff is working on a presentation which is scheduled to be presented at this month's transportation policy workshop. And that'll occur in two weeks on April 21st. Um, I have an announcement regarding uh, Caltrans sustainable transportation planning grants. Uh, Caltrans has awarded Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission a total of $786,000 for two sustainable transportation planning grants for reports that will focus on climate adaptation and transportation equity in Santa Cruz County. The RTC and the County of Santa Cruz received $448,000 $800 to develop a climate adaptation, vulnerability assessment, and transportation priorities report for unincorporated Santa Cruz County maintained roads and the Santa Cruz branch rail line. The emphasis of the vulnerability assessment will be on identifying vulnerable transportation infrastructure and the associated hazards such as wildfire, mud debris flows, extreme weather flooding, and sea level rise. The priority report will identify transportation projects that can 
be impacted by climate change and those then be prioritized for actions to enhance resilience. The hazards brought on by climate change pose a serious threat to the county's transportation infrastructure and in turn threatens the safety and quality of life of our residents. Santa Cruz County is already experiencing the impacts of sea level rise, coastal erosion, extreme weather events, and flooding, wildfires, and extreme temperatures on the county's transportation infrastructure. <coughs> this report will be very impactful in guiding the RTC and the county as it works to maintain the existing transportation network and plans for transportation needs in the future. The RTC also received $338,000 to develop the Santa Cruz County Transportation Equity Action Plan to address transportation equity and other transportation disparities in the community. This plan will include an equity analysis of the existing transportation network, transportation projects and services, plans, policies, procedures, a public outreach tool toolkit to, to proactively engage disadvantaged communities, the establishment of an equity work group, extensive collaborative stakeholder and public engagement, and the development of equity performance metrics. About half of the county's residents are transportation disadvantaged. Once developed, this action plan will provide us with the tools and information needed to prioritize transportation investments that will improve access, safety, health, mobility, housing, and job access for marginalized, segmented, and other disadvantaged communities in Santa Cruz County. RTC staff, staff is excited to get started on these important planning studies and will provide more information regarding schedule and public participation opportunities over the next few months. Thank you, Caltrans, but also special thanks to Ginger Dicar, Rachel Morricone, and Shannon Munz for their work on the grant applications. I would like to uh, welcome Stephanie Britt to RTC staff. Um, we are very pleased to have Stephanie Britt, a new member of the RTC team. She began her work this Monday as a transportation planning technician, and she is in attendance today. You'll see her and a uh, panelist on the Zoom link here. Uh, Stephanie has a Bachelor's of Art degree from UCLA with majors in political science and global studies. She has a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Laverne. In May, she will have earned a Master's of Urban Planning from the University of Southern California. For the past two and a half years, Stephanie has been working with the city of San Marino as a management analyst, where she launched their very first economic development program. Stephanie also worked with a group of stakeholders to develop and present a city beautification streetscape program, which included community outreach, working with the public and presentations to the city council. Stephanie is fully fluent in Spanish. After completing her BA degree, she worked with the Trade Commission of Peru, where she reached out to Peruvian companies and helped them connect with American importers. She used both English and Spanish to write documents and translate for businesses. Stephanie is also familiar with the Central Close as she lived in Salinas for a period of time and was eager to return to the area. Stephanie will be working with great Grace Blakesley on the Regional Conservation Investment Study and assisting other planners with other projects. Her education, experience in community and outreach and bilingual skills will make her a great asset on a number of RTC projects and help the RTC ensure improved public engagement. Welcome, Stephanie. And with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Chair Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Director Preston, and welcome, uh, Ms. Britt. We're excited to have you on board. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we do have, I see uh, that Brian from Trail Now has a hand up, so I'll call on you, uh, Brian, thank you. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I just uh, wanted to remind that I sent an email to the chair and co-chair on the ultimate trail um, versus the interim trail and uh, the importance about communicating to the public. Um, right now, we believe there's a miscommunication to the public on the ultimate trail. The plan is for a slow moving freight train, not the commuter rail transit that was 
approved by the preferred alternative transportation corridor analysis study in March 2021, which would have 60 trains a day from 6 a.m. to uh, to 9 p.m. going 45 to 60 miles an hour. As a reminder, Executive Director Guy Preston said that uh, in order to move forward with the commuter rail transit, we would need a 30% design for the proposed rail system and a new environmental impact report. So it's important that the public understands the trail design team is designing a trail. They're not designing a rail system. So it's uh, very most likely in the ultimate trail, if you were to put in a commuter rail transit system, you would have to pull all those rails out. You would have to put in new uh, stations, cross guards, uh, passing sightings. So I think there's a lot of confusion in the meetings that I've been attending. Those questions come up a lot. And so I think it's important for the, the staff to communicate that the ultimate trail does not include in their cost of building the ultimate trail. It is not for a commuter rail transit. Thank you for your time. Very much appreciate the work that staff and Mr. Preston are doing. They're doing a phenomenal job. Very good work. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, I don't see any hands up from commissioners. Does anybody have questions or comments for on Director Preston's report? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to our Caltrans report and I'll turn it over to, uh, oh, it looks like uh, Commissioner Hernandez, did you have a question or comment for Director Preston? Felipe? Yes, uh, not a question, you know, I'm I'm excited about the grant, uh, the you know the the equity grant as well, the uh, and the, you know the bilingual staff that we have now too, uh, especially for uh, South County. You know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity and need as well here in South County, and you know if there's ever a chance to to, to um, you know come come in and meet some of the city staff over here and some of the folks over here in Watsonville, I think that. We should definitely uh, take advantage of that as well. Uh, a lot of stuff with the um, with the uh, active transportation that we still need a, a lot of work on here in this area. Um, and so with our Vision Zero uh, plan that we have, so, I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So thank you, thank you so much. And I appreciate all the work that you guys do with, with uh, seeking these grants as well. And I'm excited that we have a, a bilingual staff too. Thank you. Okay, right, thank you. Okay, now we will uh, turn it over to Scott Eads for a Caltrans report. All right, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Again, Scott Eads with you here today for Caltrans. Uh, first, I want to uh, welcome Stephanie Britt. I'm looking forward to working with you. Sounds like you're going to be another really qualified member of the SEC RTC staff. Um, Director Preston beat me to the punch on the sustainable transportation planning grants. Um, so just, I'll just say, uh, congratulations to staff, um, within all of district five, we received, um, or I should say that, um, others received a total of about 2.3 million. And so the amount that, um, RTC was awarded was about a third of, um, everything that was awarded in District 5. So again, I think that speaks to the quality of the work um, that staff is doing to put together applications to apply for these competitive grants. Um, I also wanted to highlight that um, in addition to the ones that, that RTC received, there was also another awarded to AMBAG for a Central Coast Sustainable Freight Study, which will um, cover the five counties within District 5 and will also include um, Santa Cruz County. Uh, also, I wanted to highlight that um, kind of a, a evolving um, world in terms of the Federal Highway Administration and how they're thinking about transportation um, and the types of projects that are important. 
And we're seeing a shift there that's really aligning with where Caltrans has been going um, and the state has been going, state of California has been going um, over the last few years. And that is moving to a complete streets design model. Um, they just su submitted a report to Congress um, specifically on complete streets and that being a greater focus for um, how they're going to be thinking about projects and, and funding opportunities and um, the types of projects they'll be funding. So. Um, complete streets, I think you're all very aware is about making sure that it's facilities, the facilities that we own and operate work for all users, um, especially those that are more and most vulnerable um, on the roadway and that's bicycles and pedestrians and transit users. So complete streets is all about making sure that we're designing and building and funding facilities that work for all users. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is um, at the last meeting, Commissioner Bertrand um, brought up a reconnecting communities, highways to boulevards program. Caught me by surprise um, because I was aware of a federal program with that name, um, but I was not very aware of what's happening on the state level. So it, it turns out that there is a state program that's been, it's really a proposal at this point in time. The details are still being worked out. So we do not have a lot of information in terms of um, exactly how the funding program will be set up and what the criteria will be for funding. Um, and I think the question was more specific to what types of highways and what types of boulevards and that information just isn't available yet. So um, as information becomes available, I'll uh, share it or your staff will um, make sure and have that available too as well. Um, but at this point, it's really just a evolving proposal. That concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Commissioner Eads. Are there questions or comments about the Caltrans report from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Hurst. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Eads. You know, the, the influence of Caltrans is very important to uh, Santa Cruz County and the region. We're, we're really pleased to see of all the improvements that uh, are taking place you know, I, I went through the 129 roundabout not too long ago, and what a great improvement on that intersection in Lakeview Road for safety and uh, transportation efficiency. I'm also glad to hear about the AMBAG uh, study for sustainable freight. You know, when you look at the uh, logistic issues uh, countrywide and the supply chain issues, it re we reflect back upon the necessity to get goods and to ship goods. And so I'm anxious to see what Caltrans will come up with uh, and AMBAG particularly when it comes to uh, sustainable freight. So good luck. Thank you very much for uh, your cooperation and your participation, particularly in Watsonville and South County and getting our people moving. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, Scott, I'd just like to um, uh, thank you very much for the cooperation with Caltrans and the city of Capitola. We're trying to uh, deal with some maintenance issues on our uh, crossroads at uh, 41st, especially. And um, also, thanks for getting back on that question I had and look forward to further reports on that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hernandez. Well, I have to say that I'm really excited about the complete streets uh, focus because, you know, for a while we've been really uh, trying to get the whole 152, you know, a little more, um, you know, walkable and also, you know, making sure that we have the, the bike and pedestrian uh, safe infrastructure built around it as well. And, you know, along all its uh, downtown too. So, and you know that, highway goes right through our downtown. So I'm really excited about the focus of complete streets um, because our downtown is essentially a highway and it connects our, our housing to all of our downtown schools too. So it's definitely a project for complete streets that we can uh, apply for uh, funding in the future. If, if I could respond to that, um, Chair Brown. Um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we we actually were successful, Caltrans was successful in applying for additional shop funds specifically to increase complete streets elements in downtown Watsonville. And so we're successful in that and we are um, continuing to move forward and coordinating closely with city staff on um, 
you know, how to do that best to make sure it works with the, the remaining, you know, the adjacent city streets and the needs that you have there. Thank you. Okay. I do not see any other hands up uh, from commissioners and uh, nor from the audience. So with that, we will move on to our next item. Uh, this is item 22, a measure D potential financing options presentation. And I'll turn it over to Tracy New, I believe, our, our, um, and our budget director and uh, budget and finance director, excuse me, and uh, Director Preston. Thank you, Chair Brown. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public. Tracy New of RC, RTC staff, and here with us today is Melissa Schick and David Leifer from KNN Public Finance. In June 2019, KNN Public Finance, the municipal advisory firm contracted to provide financial advisory services to the RTC, presented a broad overview of the Measure D expenditure plan, revenue allocation, cash flow model, and the development of the inaugural strategic implementation plan. KNN also presented on funding and borrowing options for Measure D projects and programs. KNN provided another broad overview of the funding and borrowing options to the Budget and Administration Personnel Committee at their meeting on March 10th, 2022. KNN Public Finance is here today to present the Commission an overview of bonding as the RTC evaluates funding options and strategies in the pursuit of securing SB1 grant funding for highway and coastal rail trail projects. Executive Director Guy Preston will start with the overview of the presentation. Thank you, Tracy. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, I'll start with a quick overview. Um, fortunately, I'm having a little issue with my screen. There we go. Um, staff has been gearing up for some um, funding opportunities on the horizon that could potentially fully fund construction of some of our priority projects under development within both the highway corridors and the coastal rail trail active transportation categories of Measure D. As you are aware, there will be a call for projects for two Senate Bill 1 programs, the Solutions to Congested Corridors and the Local Partnership Program later this year. And information about these projects and their costs have been presented to the Commission last month. The local match for these grant programs will be needed um, to, local, to be locally funded by Measure D which requires a commitment by the commission for the local match as part of the grant applications. In addition, the call for projects for the active transportation program will be released this spring with applications scheduled to be due in June of this year. Staff is considering sales tax revenue bonds to help fund the local match requirements of both Measure D programs. Staff also recognizes that there may be future opportunities for sales tax revenue bonds to fund priority projects in the other regional programs, including uh, the rail and highway nine categories. So let's uh, provide a little background on previous discussions on financing for Measure D. First, staff and KNN presented to the Budget Administration and Policy Committee and the Commission as part of the development of the 2020 Measure D Strategic Implementation Plan, but we decided not to implement bonding at that time. As part of that discussion, the county and RTC staff also discussed bonding for deferred maintenance, but it was decided it would be better suited if the county implemented their own financing. Um, and, finally, finan and finally, financing was determined to be needed to fully fund the Highway uh, 17 crossing project from the Measure D program. But instead of bonding, the commission authorized an interprogram loan, and the project is under construction now. The needed funds were borrowed from the Measure D highway program and will be paid back over the remaining life of the measure. 
Finally, we made a similar presentation to today's uh, presentation to the BAP last month. And uh, with that, I'm now going to hand it over to David Leifer and Melissa Schenk from KNN Public Finance to discuss financing in more detail. Thank you, Guy. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. David Leifer here with Melissa Schick from KNN Public Finance, the Commission's Public Finance or Municipal Advisor. And as Guy mentioned, uh, we're, I, I have a short presentation, just four slides, uh, to provide somewhat of a high level introduction and for some of you a reintroduction to uh, the process. Uh, by which we you go about planning for potential bonds so that if a bond uh, proposal is brought before you, we all will have um, a, a, a basic understanding of, of the concepts. Um, so on this first slide, um, I've outlined really the two primary options, if you will, or approaches for funding, uh, you know, large municipal public infrastructure projects. And they are uh, pay as you go or, or leveraging uh, revenues through, uh, through bonding. Uh, and just a, just a word about both of them. Pay as you go, of course, uh, requires that you have ample cash on hand uh, uh, to cover whatever uh, costs that you may be incurring uh, for capital. And of course, when there's a large capital project, often those costs become a bottleneck and, and there isn't enough cash coming in each year, though there would be adequate cash coming in over time. Uh, and that's when we talk about bonding. But pay as you go uh, certainly is the lower cost option in some respects in that you're not having to you know, borrow and repay with interest. Uh, but it does uh, present challenges for accelerating the delivery of, of, of projects in a single phase. And there can be some, some costs incurred uh, from a pay as you go approach in, in terms of inflation uh, costs related to construction if one needs to wait multiple years to actually uh, incur construction. So that's the, the trade-off. And then on the flip side, borrowing is an opportunity or using the capital markets to accel accelerate uh, delivery of projects that are ready to go. We call them shovel ready, but that they've been through uh, design and engineering and planning, et cetera. And as I mentioned already, there, in one respect, you can minimize costs by avoiding uh, it, you know, the future growth and in inflation and in construction costs. But the flip side is that you are paying something for that in terms of the interest uh, in terms of the interest rate on the bonds. And then, of course, another benefit, uh, and I'm on page four, um, another benefit um, of, of, of doing a, a borrowing is that you're spreading the costs uh, of financing the project over a long period of time, which lines up nicely often with uh, the useful life of the project that you're building and the users that will uh, enjoy uh, the benefits of that project. At the end of the day, what's optimal? Usually we find in projects like this that the optimal finding financing plan, you know, tends to involve some sort of mix of the two. Uh, you know, you want to maximize the pay go to the extent you can, uh, but use uh, other funding, grant funding certainly is, 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 is preferred first. And then, and then of course, borrowing uh, to be able to accelerate and deliver projects, uh, both in a timely and cost-effective way. And, and sometimes we'll look at, you know, where the municipal market interest rates are and, and try and, and maximize the the borrowing portion of the overall financing plan when uh, rates are low. Okay, uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is uh, just an introduction to the idea of a cash flow model. And we work with staff closely on this and we've come uh, together developed a cash flow model for Measure D. And um, the goal in the cash flow model is to sort of manage just that analysis that I was talking about. What's the optimal use of cash and potential borrowing? And how do we identify when you need a borrowing and whether you need a borrowing and, and how much? And the cash flow model sort of tells us that. We have, uh, these are just illustrative examples. We're gonna be coming back to you in a matter of weeks or, or, or shortly uh, with uh, some specific cash flow models with actual dollars. But wanted to introduce the concept here, uh, revenues in, they get allocated, uh, both you know direct allocation and then for the regional projects. And then we sort of look at the construction costs and the timing and amount of construction costs and see where 
we go into a deficit. And when we go into a deficit, that's obviously an opportunity to, uh, to fill that deficit with a bond. And then we would drop in, we would calculate you know, how much uh, bonding would be needed to meet that deficit and, and bring you up to a, at least a minimum cash balance that is comfortable. Um, and then we would drop in the debt service for those bonds, including the principal repayment and the interest. And, and see what impact that has on overall cash. And so, as I say in the second bullet, staff is in the process of developing, you know, the five-year programs of Measure D regional categories, uh, which requires us to update this model and then look at your uh, bonding needs and bonding capacity. And so we've listed here some of the updates that are in progress. We're gonna look at the actual sales tax revenues that have come in to date, uh, project them out uh, using some re uh, reasonable growth rates, uh, assumptions, and then look at the actual project cost schedules and and uh, and amounts. Uh, layer in any other funding sources. Uh, identify what we think is a reasonable cash balance target, so that you can maintain any fluctuations in in future revenues or expenses. And then and then see where interprogram loans might be efficiently used, if at all, in lieu of of capital markets bonding. So we're going to come back to you, uh, but I just wanted to introduce this idea of the cash flow model. Uh, because this is really what determines, you know, whether uh, bonding is even needed and 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 by how much. Okay, on the last two slides, if you can go to the next slide, I just want to introduce a couple of considerations when we think about bonding. Uh, and again, this idea of do we need to bond? How much might we bond? Uh, and what's the optimal use? And so the first consideration is 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 how much or whether you need to borrow. And again, that's going to be driven by the estimated uh, expenditure and construction schedules for the projects as they get dropped into the cash flow model. Those are going to be the primary drivers of the timing and amounts. And of course, you know, before bonding, the projects must be sort of fully baked uh, in, in, in terms of bonding. So evidence of compliance with CEQA and other permitting uh, that might be required really should be done prior to going out to the market for bonds. So we don't, we don't, uh, you know, jump the gun too much. And then we have to take into account the tax law uh, requirements. And basically, without doing a full digression into sort of municipal finance uh, tax law, um, there's a requirement when you borrow uh, with tax exempt bonds that the borrower has a reasonable expectation of spending the bond proceeds largely within three years of issuance. So that's critically important. When we're going to look at that cash flow model and we see it goes red, we're going to look ahead for about three years of red and combine those three years and say, okay, that's that's sort of the maximum amount we might bond for because that's the amount, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more because we might be able to expend other other monies uh, as well in that time frame. But that that sort of is our guideline. And keep in mind just what is a, you know, to digress for one minute, what is a tax exempt bond? What does that mean? A tax exempt bond is a loan from an investor to you. And, and by tax exempt, it means that the investor does not pay income tax on the interest that you are going to pay to them for the right to borrow their money. So because they don't need to pay income tax, or at least federal income tax on that, and probably not state income tax, they're going to lend to you at a lower rate then they would lend to another entity that can't issue tax exempt bonds. And tax exemption is sort of a preference under the tax code for local governments and governments. Corporations don't benefit that way. So that's why we want to use this tool when we can. So that's the idea of the borrowing need in terms of the timing. It's based on sort of a number of variables, uh, again, having to do with the construction schedule, but also that IRS expenditure requirement and your borrowing capacity. That's going to dictate to us you know, sort of when's the optimal time uh, to get into the market that we might also look at where our interest rates uh, today versus where we might think they're going to be at some point in the future. And, and for those who have followed, interest rates have been on the rise recently as the Fed tries to tackle inflation and, um, you know, uh, slow down um, the very high cost of inflation right now. So there's an expectation that rates will continue to rise in the future. Uh, it's not uncommon for surface transportation programs, uh, you know, that are secured by sales tax uh, to see multiple borrowings over the course of an entire tax measure. So you do a borrowing maybe for three years of expenditures, 
uh, and then perhaps wait. Uh, and and because these expenditures are often you know transpire over a long period of time, you know there might be a second borrowing needed down the road. We try and minimize the number of borrowings certainly, uh, but at the same time have to work with the constraints of the tax code, et cetera. And basically the tax code is saying, hey, we don't want you borrowing money today uh, for a project that you know isn't going to be for five or 10 years, because then you're just going to stick the money in the bank and you're going to earn some arbitrage. And, and the federal government doesn't like that. They don't want you to borrow in order to make money. They want you to borrow to deliver projects. Uh, in terms of how long your borrowing can be, really the, the primary restriction is the term of the tax itself which is March 31st, 2047. So uh, we will, you know, can do a borrowing up to the term of the tax. So it really depends on when we get into the market. You know, is it today? Is it two years from now? Is it four years? That'll dictate the final term on the bond. Obviously you can't go longer than that because you'll have no revenue with which to pay back the bonds beyond, uh, you know, March 31, 2047. Um, there's some other rules that we have to be mindful of that the tax law requires about the average life of the borrowing, not uh, extending beyond the useful life of the projects being financed. I don't think that's going to be a big limiter here. Uh, the useful life of most of the projects uh, are likely to be, uh, you know, largely coterminous with the borrowing um, term. So I'm not too worried about that. Finally, on the next page, just a few other factors we often get questions about. Well, how much? How much can I borrow if I wanted to borrow? You know, uh, and we realize that's dictated by the cash flow model in part, whether you need to borrow. But but your overall capacity, there are some constraints. You can't, you don't have just unlimited capacity to borrow, and that starts with the actual sales tax revenues that you have with which to pay back the bonds. And and from a market point of view, what we do is, and in the year in which you borrow, we look at your actual sales tax revenues really going back the last 12 months. And we assume that that is what you will be receiving going forward, even though we know that you're probably gonna have some growth over time, but the market really doesn't let you bond against that growth. So any growth that occurs will be available to you for pay as you go or some future bond issue uh, that you may do, you know, three to five years down the road. Um, and that's really the second point, issuances further in the life of the tax benefit from that growth. Uh, or, or as does your, your pay-as-you-go dollars. Um, and then, you know, higher actual sales tax revenues can support a greater amount of annual debt service. Uh, that's pretty, pretty straightforward, and that results in more bonding capacity. The more debt service you can encourage here, the, the more principal you can borrow up front. Uh, but how do we really calculate that? Like, what's your maximum debt capacity? If we know you have a million dollars a year in sales tax revenues, just to use a, a, a simple example, or a million and a half in, in this example, how much could you borrow? Well, what the market says is we want to be able to demonstrate what we call debt service coverage. Uh, you know, bonds are sized in a way so that sales tax revenues that you're expected to receive exceed the amount of your annual debt service by a certain cushion factor. And that's to help protect against fluctuations in revenues because the investor is looking only to the sales tax revenue to be repaid. They're not looking to the general fund of the county or the cities or any entity or any other revenues. It's just secured by the sales tax. So if there were to be, uh, say, a recessionary event, as we have seen at, you know, during the pandemic, as we saw back in 2009 and 10, and as is predicted, frankly, for 2023, perhaps, uh, and sales tax revenues were to decline, the investor wants to make sure there's enough money there that they get paid back. So they require that we size the bond so that the annual revenues exceed the annual debt service by a cushion factor. And in this example, say a million and a half of annual sales tax revenues are projected. So maybe we structure your bond so that it has a million dollars of debt service each year. And that's what we call 1.5 times debt service coverage. Then we can back into how much you can borrow and what your capacity is. And, and how much that capacity is will also be dictated by how many years is left on the tax. The more years left on the tax, the more that you uh, will have in terms of debt capacity, the fewer years on tax, uh, the fewer, uh, the lower the debt capacity, because all those years of sales tax revenues will have already come in and you will either have it in the bank or you will have spent it on projects on a pay-as-you-go basis. 
Final factor that impacts debt capacity are the interest rates, of course, the borrowing rates. Um, higher interest rates result in lower debt capacity and conversely lower rates uh, in, you know, result in higher capacity because um, every dollar you spend on interest is one less dollar to pay back the principal amount of your, of your loan, just like a home mortgage, frankly, in a lot of ways. So these are all the, the variables that are, uh, that are juggled in the context of analyzing your debt capacity. But we always start with that cash flow model. We layer in actual sales tax revenues. We come up with a debt service coverage factor. We look at the years left in the tax and then where interest rates are at the time of sale. So we will run uh, interest rate scenarios right now for you and come up with debt capacity. And we'll probably build in some cushion. We'll say, we know you're not bonding you know, uh, next month. So let's take the current market interest rates and add whatever, 50 basis points, maybe 100 basis points if we wanted to be really conservative or a full percent uh, when we run um, your debt capacity uh, calculations. Um, so Guy, that really covers the slides that I was gonna cover. Are, are, are you, Tracy, covering the conclusion or did you want me to do that? No, that's okay, David, I'll take it from here. So um, the next steps um, include receiving input from the commission about the possibility of implementing bonding as a strategy to advance regional projects. Um, we are currently planning to give a presentation about bonding to the um, uh, TPW um, in a couple of weeks. Um, we are um, developing the five-year plans for the regional programs to evaluate, evaluate the near-term PAGO capacity of each program. And then we're working with KNN to develop the cash flow scenarios, uh, which David mentioned earlier, and they'll um, include some level of bonding needed to fund the local match for the upcoming grant opportunities. Um, so uh, today, uh, your input will be helpful in uh, preparation for our TPW meeting. Um, Madam Chair, that concludes our presentation, and I now hand it back over to you for Commissioner questions and public com comment, followed by um, your discussion. Right. Thank you so much uh, to our RTC staff and k &N consultants for the presentation. I'll now open it up to questions from Commissioners. Commissioner Rotkin. Thanks. Thank Guy and our, our consultants. Thank you for the presentation. I think it's very helpful and clear to the public to understand sort of what we're uh, considering getting involved in here. Um, my question has to go to a, a comment that Guy Preston made in, in, in his presentation. Um, talked about the fact that we're currently uh, developing a plan for highway, and which includes bus on shoulder, I assume, uh, and active transportation funding. And then I think in your, if I got it correct in your comments later, uh, we're gonna be looking at um, rail and highway nine possibilities um, in terms of, uh, you know, the funding model or you know, the stuff that, we, that uh, we were just talking about. And the question I have, and I, members of the public have been asking me this, I wanted to give Guy a chance to explain how, how is the decision made or how do you make the priority decision that, um, this, you know, obviously it's been uh, rail supporters have been arguing like, well, you know, why, are, why is that later? Why don't we do that now? Isn't that part of our stuff? Now we had a vote that was a split a tied 6-6 six, six vote on the commission. So you didn't get clear direction from us, you know, full steam ahead on the, on the rail. That's certainly one background piece of information. But in general, you know, the argument's been made that if you, if you had, you were asked earlier, for example, from the public, why, you know, why don't we apply for more grants for the rail program? passenger rail program. Um, and the answer was, well, we didn't think we we're like, in some at least particular cases, that didn't look like a grant we were likely to get. Mm -hmm. The highway thing is underway already. We're moving ahead where we have indicators that we're gonna get funding for that and so forth. But I, I'm trying to get a, uh, a comment out about, you know, how, how do you make the decision that you're gonna apply in these two areas? The other two areas are later. Um, if you had a 30% design and EIR done, you'd be in, we would be in a better position to apply for grants than, than simply a vague desire to have some kind of rail program in the future. So I, it's a pretty open-ended question, but I wanted to give you a chance to sort of explain to the public how these decisions are getting made and sort of what your, your thoughts are about the prioritization of these issues. Thank you. 
So one of the comment, comments that David Leiper made in his presentation was um, the need to have compliance with uh, CEQA um, to be able to issue revenue bonds for the construction capital. Right, right now, we got um, two programs that are advancing fairly quickly, the highway program and the active transportation programs. Um, environmental documents are underway. We expect to complete them next year we will be in position to be able to say that SQL will be completed and that we would have a reasonable expectation to be able to expend the bond uh, proceeds in three years um, subject to grant funding. Um, those grant funding programs that we're looking at, some of them require SQL compliance, uh, the ones for the highway do. Um, the ones for ATP do not, um, but those, um, uh, programs uh, are already advancing um, EIRs, and we would be looking for um, spending the bond proceeds on um, the capital costs, and we would be in position to expend those funds in the next three years. Uh, we did talk about and looked at the Highway 9 and the rail pots, and um, those uh, programs are not as far along. Uh, we don't uh, have an EIR for passenger rail, like you mentioned. Um, but there is the possibility that we could try to find a way to fund an EIR for passenger rail service. And we can talk about that a little bit more at the TPW meeting about <clears throat> what funding opportunities there are. And um, we could certainly look to do that in the future. One of the challenges about the rail pot of money is it's only nine, uh, excuse me, eight percent, eight, eight percent right. uh, measure the revenue total. So there's um, not really the funding to construct uh, rail. In fact, it's prohibited from Measure D. Um, it only provides uh, funding for preservation of the rail line and for um, uh, 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 additional studies on the rail line. Um, so we couldn't bond off of the Measure D funds for the rail pot to do any um, construction of passenger rail service. We could potentially bond for uh, freight rail repairs, um, but with only 8% um, of the revenue right now, we show that the total revenue generated over the 30 years would not be enough money to complete all the freight repairs that are needed on the line. Um, so to bond to bring the money forward, we wouldn't have enough money to complete the program and also pay back the loans. So I hope that answers your questions. I'd certainly be willing to talk about it a little bit more if, uh, if you have additional questions. It's a start. I'll say that. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. Um, let's see. Commissioner Koenig. You're Commissioner. up. Uh, yeah, I mean, just wanted to say I'm totally supportive of going out for some revenue bonds to complete the active transportation and highway project. Um, you know, I did check in with County Public Works, um, well, the Community Development and Infrastructure Department, uh, again yesterday on whether there would be any renewed interest in bonding. And you know, we're, we're really in a very different situation there where we've got a ton of, of different small projects that need to maintain flexibility in the future as far as having money available uh, to deal with things that come up in the short term. But I mean, I think in our situation here at the RTC, where we really just have a handful of key projects that we want to complete and, um, you know, we're doing this high level of, um, of design and, and environmental review on them, I, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, I guess my question is, I mean, you, you touched on this uh, a little bit, Mr. Leifer, um, but I mean, I, as you said, re, uh, interest rates are, are rapidly increasing. We expect the Fed to, um, you know, potentially increase base interest rates more than 2% this year. Um, and, uh, you know, it sounds like we're limited if, as far as timing goes, as far as having to have those EIRs done. Um, so, I mean, just, is there any way that we can go out to the market sooner? I mean, it seems that time is of the essence. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, Commissioner. Uh, you know, a couple of comments. First, yes, there's been uh, some, uh, a, you know, significant run up in rates since January. And as you pointed out, the Fed has telegraphed multiple uh, potential increase in the Fed funds rate over the remaining part of the year. That said, uh, increases in the Fed funds rate, which are you know, the short rate, the short term borrowing rate, don't always equate to increases in the long term rates. In fact, it's intended in part to dampen 
uh, to dampen that. Now, that doesn't mean that can't happen, especially with the intense inflationary pressures that we're seeing. So that's just one point. But in terms of your other question about are there ways to accelerate, we need to really get our hands around this cash flow model first and see what the needs are and see how fully developed those um, those construction expenditure figures are. And is there a reasonable expectation that you will incur uh, and be able to spend you know, money within the three-year tax limit? So that's really the first issue. And I think once we get our hands on around that issue, hopefully quickly we can get back to you uh, with an idea how quickly we can get into the market. I think generally the idea of getting into the market quickly is a good one uh, if you're going to need to borrow anyway. And... Um, I, you know the you know the I've already shared the bad news. The good news is rates are still very attractive, sort of on a historical perspective. I mean, we're still well below the last you know the averages of of the last certainly the last twenty years uh, on in municipal rates. So we want to kind of you know move forward as quickly as we can. The bond issue itself, I know I know Guy uh, himself is very experienced from his prior work at Sonoma. Uh, a, a bond issue can be brought to market relatively quickly. Uh, you know, the course of several months, uh, probably three months, four months at the outside. Um, so we just have to sort of, you know, follow the steps. Um, there really is no way, however, to answer your question finally with more fullness, you know, to uh, uh, lock in rates today to deliver bonds in the future. I mean, there are, there are, there are sort of derivative instruments that are used to do that. Uh, they carry with them some risks. If you don't issue, you might owe money. Uh, so, you know, I think we want to dip our toe, you know, cautiously in using derivative instruments. And, you know, I think for an agency with your sort of size, we want to uh, keep it simple uh, and and make sure we're making good decisions. So we're certainly happy to present all those options, but I think the best is is to borrow once um, once all the ducks are in order. Okay, thank you. I look forward to seeing those cash flow models soon. Yes, yeah, yeah, we too. Um, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Johnson, you're up. Thank you. Uh, since you brought up Sonoma County and, and what guy uh, had been there and has a lot of experience, what happened with the smart train with respect to their bonds? I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it, I've, I think we've been watching that from afar where they went out, tried to get another measure because, and I don't fully understand why, but I think that one failed. So was there a risk there or what? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't work on the SMART program particularly. I do work on Sonoma County Transportation Authority generally. So SMART, uh, you know, they got their tax passed and eventually they bonded for, you know, as much as they could support with the tax. Uh, they had some timing challenges because when the tax was passed, immediately uh, the subprime crisis hit. You know, almost immediately. I think a uh, guy the tax was passed maybe in 06 at the earliest, maybe 08. I can't remember. And then, of course, in 08, 09, we had huge drops in the stock market. We had uh, a big recession and uh, the Great Recession. And so sales taxes suddenly dropped, plummeted. And so they were able to borrow less than they thought they would be able to borrow, first of all. So that was one challenge. And as a result, they had to phase the program. Uh, they didn't get some of the stations done that they had wanted to get, which were further up county in the north, uh, all the way up to Healdsburg. Um, you know, obviously some of that was going to always depend on federal money and state money, and there wasn't a ton of it back then due to the politics and the different administrations, et cetera. So they had a lot of challenges. And then now they're just dealing with low ridership challenge. I mean, that's really the reality. And, you know, with low ridership in part due to the pandemic, um, and um, so, you know, that creates, you know, stress on operations and they need to use more of their sales tax for operations than for capital. So it's a little different because they're running a transit system and there isn't a transit system in the country that is fully, you know, uh, self-sufficient based on fare box. That just doesn't exist. You know, they all, you know, require uh, federal or, or state or other aid uh, or voter approved aid. And so that's their challenge right now. I know that you're right. They went out to the ballot box. I think they lost uh, pretty handsomely, <laughs> handily. And uh, I think what happened, Guy, you can remind me on the first ballot, and that was Sonoma, Sonoma wanted it and Marin didn't, I think, when the first vote happened. Uh, but there were more voters in Sonoma 
at the time uh, so that outweighed the sort of negative sentiment by the Marin voters. This time, I think they all were feeling a bit overtaxed and uh, and didn't come out to support. So I think they're hopeful that they'll be able to go out and uh, you know go again with a measure. Um, so that's that's what I know. You know, but again, I'm not an insider. Thank you. So yeah. I'll elaborate a little bit. Um, there's a lot of parallels between Sonoma and Santa Cruz. Um, their initial transportation sales tax measure was uh, had an expenditure plan that also didn't allow money to be used for um, new rail service. Um, it was just for um, uh, work on an environmental document and, and on um, repairs at crossing locations. Um, so they needed to issue um, their own independent um, sales tax measure um, to fund the actual passenger rail service. And that's the measure that David was mentioning was passed in 2008, um, right at the beginning of the Great Recession. And that uh, they did borrow off of that, but that funding was not enough uh, to complete the system. And so they tried to issue a second revenue bond um, a couple of years ago, and that did not pass. And that that was the issue with, with Sonoma. So their, their system is uh, being phased. Um, they started with an initial operating uh, segment between uh, San Rafael and um, uh, Santa Rosa. Um, but they, uh, uh, they've they been able to get some grant funding for extensions down to Larkspur and up to Windsor, but they're not yet um, up to Cloverdale, and um, there are some constraints on them being able to make it up to Fieldsburg as well. So that's uh, the issue with SMART right now. Thank you. All right. Are there uh, other questions from... Commissioners, it sounds like we'll be diving into this further at our next uh, transportation policy workshop. So look forward to that. And thank you so much for your presentation. Um, looking to see if any members of the public are interested in speaking. And I see a hand up. <laughs> um, so um, let's see. It looks like Michael Saint, you're up first. And you are muted. Hey, thank you, Chair Brown. Just a quick question. That was a very good presentation. It answered most of my questions I had uh, originally. So my question, I guess, is does the citizenship vote on this bonding? Um, and if it doesn't pass, uh, will there be any studies on what the op alternatives might, might be? And, and would it be a possibility if it does not pass? that the uh, highway widening Ox Lane project would not be feasible. Uh, that's mainly my main question. Uh, and if it's not feasible, can monies that we've already received um, be used on maybe a less expensive project? And I know you're waiting for me to say this. Could we go just to a dedicated bus on shoulder uh, project which would be considerably less expensive and use the cash cash at hand and maybe a very small funding effort. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Um, mm -hmm. We'll uh, continue with uh, participants. We, we can just give them a, just a quick response. Bonding doesn't require a public vote. So right. those other questions are not necessary to be answered. So um, yeah, thank you. I yeah no, we do we this would not go out to the public thank, uh, for a vote. This is bonding on already approved sales tax money. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, looks like we have another attendee uh, and Jacob Wasaki. Wasaki, you are up next. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, what I'd like to highlight is the comment that um, cash flow needs to be considered very carefully. And I see you have models that are sensitive to uh, rising interest rates. And of course, interest rates are exploding right now. And um, a reminder that the, the interest rates are being um, raised in order to tame inflation. And the other word for that is to cause recession um, and to kill demand. 
And so some of the, the comments that um, Guy Preston made about bonding out right in front of a recession um, should be very concerning. And so I'm, I'm not gonna say that um, bonding should never happen, uh, although that does fundamentally involve giving money to Wall Street out of taxpayer funds, uh, but they should be taken uh, very conservatively only at the last minute and only when absolutely justified by the numbers. Um, and so I'd just like to make sure that everybody stays very conservative and uh, not rush to bond out um, unless absolutely necessary. And thank you, that's my comment. All right, thank you. Uh, looks like hands are going up, so I'll we'll just keep going with public comments. Lonnie Faulkner, you're up. Hi, thanks. I just want to point out that was a great report. Really appreciated. That was um, helpful. Um, again, I know I've expressed this in past uh, meetings, but just concerned given the climate uh, issues given the fact that we know that highway widening is really not the best way to address traffic with induced demand, and study after study shows that, um, given that our direction needs to be moving towards robust, equitable, environmentally friendly public transportation. Um, to me, uh, anything that supports highway widening is really the wrong direction to go. And especially at a time where we don't have funding for highway widening and that we're prioritizing the energy um, towards doing this highway widening without funding being identified. I mean, I don't think it should be done anyway. And I just want to um, give a shout out. I think it was Michael Saint earlier who spoke about true bus on shoulder. And this can be seen in, um, some people know Rick Wangjanati's campaign for sustainable transportation. So instead of highway widening, a very, um, a smaller amount of money can be put into creating these bus on shoulders that would help alleviate um, traffic for people using public transportation and then urge people, it would actually inspire people to use public transportation. So I'm not sure why that hasn't been more thoroughly considered considering that it is much cheaper to go along that route. If uh, for those of you who are new to the um, RTC Commission, I would urge you to look at Rick Longinotti's plan and his video online um, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Next up, uh, Trink Praxel. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to raise a couple of questions. Um, which we can also be addressed at the TPW meeting, but um, important to raise with the full commission that um, just the, the timing of, of the, any decision on this, uh, would it be done, um, for example, before the Measure D election? And while in a way they're not related, there's certainly Measure D will give an indication um, to the commission and, and the public as whole as to the community's interest in rail. And um, it, it just seems that if we commit any, uh, uh, commit ourselves to bonding for the highway widening um, and for the trail, um, it, it could be that we leave no room for ourselves to consider any um, bonding or other financing for rail if it becomes clear that that's the way we need to be going and the community is interested in that. So I would just ask the commissioners to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Praxel. Uh, let's see, We I'm gonna do a last call for public comments on this item before we bring it back to the commission. And seeing none, this is an information item. Oh, looks like uh, Commissioner Rotkin. So uh, I, I, here's a comment that'll make me popular on every side of the divide in our community. Um, people, I myself am not a fan of the highway widening project. I didn't support it in general, but when we voted in 2016 on Measure D, there was a uh, five uh, areas of funding. There, it was it was a uh, compromise in which people voted for it because they thought there was enough in this uh, funding proposal this tax 
for the things that they wanted that they were willing to suffer the parts of it they didn't like so you know brian peoples constantly reminds us you know he didn't he didn't like the train at all but he but overall, they like, you know, given the percentages worked out, he was in favor of the measure and they supported him. He believes he, his group is singularly responsible for its success. And something I believe is probably not the case, but whatever it is, a lot of people voted for this measure with a variety of different kinds of responses and feelings. And even though, as I said, I voted for it, I support, not only voted for it, I went out and worked for it and, you know, did public speaking and a bunch of other stuff and knocking on doors. But the the, the public have told us that they want the, uh, this overall project, which includes the auxiliary lanes, even though, again, I don't particularly like them, but that's what we did. And so when people constantly tell us over and over again, like, well, why are you widening the highway? And there's all these reasons why it doesn't make sense. I mean, I can make those arguments myself, but the fact is the public have come up with a compromise and they, pieces of it they like and they don't like. And I think the commission is faithfully following the will of the voters in the way that we're spending our Measure D money. Um, the, this doesn't bear on the question of whether we might do something. Rail was also part of that. And so the question I asked earlier that there's still going to be further discussion about what prospect is there for moving the rail uh, studies forward, not the, not the construction, but the 30% design and EIR work, that's still a viable issue and a question that's out there. But the reason that the commission just seems so, unre so unresponsive when members of the public tell us like, well, why are you doing this auxiliary? And there's induced traffic, there's this, there's that. It's because the public with all that information in front of them basically told us, go ahead with this project. And so the commission is being faithful about responding to the will of the voters. And as I said, even though I don't personally like where it's going in terms of that piece of it or something, I'm on board because I want to do what the public wants us to do. So people, people wonder why we just don't jump on this stuff for, it's not because we don't care about climate change. It's, we do live in a democracy and we need to respond to the will of our voters. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, I see Commissioner Schifrin is up next. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, staff for uh, and the consultants for the presentation. Uh, this is the second time I've seen it. And I'm afraid I may have to see it again at some other meeting. Um, <laughs> I, it was presented at the Budget Administration and Personnel Committee. The way I look at it is that bonding is a potential tool in our toolbox for getting projects done. And I think that that's really what it's all about. Uh, it makes sense to me to uh, allow for this tool. I have concerns about having to pay interest. I have concerns about bringing <clears throat> projects forward within the three year period. Things tend to take longer, but it's something that we, I think we need to consider when we're trying to get funding for uh, whatever projects the commission has approved to go forward with. And that isn't, limited to any one area or in any other area. The commission has been very successful in getting funding for both active transportation projects and for uh, um, highway, highway widening projects. And you know, uh, one of our abilities to do that has to do with how much of a local share we're able to provide. And that I prefer to provide that local share um, through um, uh, pay as you go. But there may well turn out to be circumstances where, where a very high priority project would need a higher local share and other and for when we hear from our staff that that's what has to happen for us to get the outside funding um, that makes the project happen. So um, I appreciate getting this information and I, you know from my perspective, um, you know, the more work is going to be done and I look forward to, you know, learning more of the details, but at this point anyway, um, and as it's been used with other, uh, at other public agencies, it's an important tool that we need to uh, pursue. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. So our next up, Commissioner Hurst. Looks like you're muted, Lowell. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate the reminders as well. That, uh, when it comes to sales tax, we're really talking about how it's related to goods. And when you're talking about goods, you need to think about how the goods are delivered. 
or where the goods come from. And so the availability of goods has a big impact upon the uh, sales tax and certainly the supply and demand aspect of it. And so how those goods get to and from market is really important regarding sales tax. And so I don't want us to lose track of the importance of all forms of freight shipment and all forms of commercial transportation of goods, because without that, you're not going to have any sales tax. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Hurst. All right, so seeing no additional hands, um, I'll, I'll just add my appreciation and you know support for exploring the idea. I think there are, uh, as have been mentioned, strong reasons to consider this for uh, in terms of leveraging and also uh, you know for just large scale infrastructure projects that um, don't really lend themselves to a pay as you go approach. Um, oh, I see uh, Commissioner Rotkins up. I, so I just I just wanted to add that I'm looking forward to um, continuing to explore the conversation. Um, Commissioner Rotkin. Just really quick in response to one question from the public, you know, we're not going to be bonding before June. They asked the question of like, you know, should we do this bond before we know what the outcome of the current measure D is on the ballot or something? There's no way we're going to bond before June. So th that's not a factor, I don't think, in any way. That's my only comment. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, so with that, I, we will move on then to our next agenda item. Uh, thank you everybody for bringing this item to us. Uh, the next item I believe, I'm just scrolling back up, is our update on the Go Santa Cruz program. Sorry, scrolling. Um, item, great. yep. Um, item 23 is uh, Amy Naranjo. Take it away. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Sounds Thank you. Good. All right. Well, good morning, commissioners and members of the public. My name is Amy Naranjo, and I'm a transportation planner for the RTC, and I'm here today to provide an update on the Go Santa Cruz County program. Okay, let's see if this will click through. There we go. So the RTC provides transportation demand management services or TDM services through the Cruise 511 program and provides online carpool matching, multimodal trip planning, and distributes incentives through our new Go Santa Cruz mm -hmm. County platform that we license through a third party vendor called Right Amigos. So the primary focus of our, of our programs is to reduce single occupancy vehicles, vehicle trips, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Santa Cruz County. And we do that by supporting the efficiency and of the existing transportation system and providing resources and information for sustainable transportation options. So the employees can use the Go Santa Cruz County platform uh, to find carpool partners and individual rides, join or start a van pool, plan their transit trips or bicycling or walking trips, and participate in reward programs and challenges. Uh, the platform also includes an interactive user dashboard where users can access and track their commutes and progress towards personal goals all in one convenient place. Beginning this spring, users will also have access to find and connect with, partful, uh, with partners for transit, walking, on top of the existing options that we have for bike pool, carpool, and van pool. Um, additionally, participants have, zero, have access to the zero interest bike loans, e-bike demos, and one-on-one -on -one commute consultations with um, through Ecology Actions and member uh, employer membership program. However, uh, participants must be in, the participants employer must be enrolled uh, in this program to access these benefits. For employers, we offer our we provide commute options. Um, excuse me. So employers implement commute option programs for a variety of reasons uh, to provide including to provide additional employee benefits, address parking shortages and challenges, and to reduce employee vehicle trips to their work site. So our team supports organizations with their commute, uh, commute work plans, and we offer one-on-one -on -one consultations with HR managers, office administrators, facility, facility managers, employee transportation coordinators, essentially anyone who will listen to us. <laughs> Um, and with the, with the goal to facilitate the employer's participation in our new Go Santa Cruz County online platform. 
We also offer uh, employer, we also participate in employer sponsored or environmental health and awareness wellness fairs. We provide commuter tax benefit information and uh, van pool management through the platform itself. So one of the new features that we have available on the Go Santa Cruz platform is the ability for employers to create customizable commute networks for their employees. Uh, Go Santa Cruz County is essentially, it's the, it's the primary commute network for our entire county on the platform. And then organizations can set up a customized employer-based network under, under our program. Um, and then let's see, uh, sorry, I missed my spot here. Um, the employers also can use this, uh, use this specific network to connect their employees with, with uh, commute options. They can distribute incentives and rewards directly to their employees. They can track their organization's uh, savings and carbon emission reductions, and as well as uh, have access to a variety of survey tools to understand a bit more about their employees' commuting patterns. In addition to the compute network, we also offer the following commuter workshops and safety trainings for participating employers. Uh, we have Intro to E-Bikes, which is our most popular workshop, uh, Bike Commuting 101 in Urban Bicycling. Workshops are tailored to the organization's needs and participants must enroll in Go Santa Cruz County in order to receive their free bike helmet and bike light set uh, as part of their participation. Go Santa Cruz County participants uh, earn points for logging their, their transportation trips on our platform, which can then be redeemed for $5, $10, and $25 e-cards. Uh, and these cards are redeemable to 75 plus national retailers online, or the, commute, or the rewards can be donated to a nonprofit organization of the participant's choice. In addition, we also run monthly raffles where participants have a chance to win a 20, uh, $25 Visa gift card, which can be used at local retailers. And in the last year, we distributed nearly $2,000 uh, $2, worth of commute reward gift cards to uh, participants. Mm -hmm. So many of our usual PDM activities were scaled back this past year due to COVID and related restrictions with, um, with social distancing, reduced service and so forth. So we really try to focus our coverage on promoting the program itself, making people aware of the, the offerings that we have um, and, and announcing um, the, the commute rewards that we have, we just, uh, we offered. Um, in addition, we created bilingual brochures and flyers for employers and participants. We created a new website landing page we participated in radio and TV uh, interviews. We had email and a variety of social media campaigns uh, where we were posting uh, tips and tricks for, for getting the most out of your commute. We participated in uh, the Midtown Fridays local events uh, in, in Santa Cruz, as well as um, working with Dominican Hospital uh, and providing e-bike demos at their employee sustainability fair and uh, and providing information about the program as well. So the difference we've made so far. So in, in the, the last couple of years since we've had this program available to commuters, both in the downtown core, as well as throughout the county, we've had more than 2,700 participants enroll in the program. Um, and that's as of this week. Uh, since the countywide expansion in 2021, or in April 2021, so just under a year I've been, uh, we've had more than 1,500 new users join. Our participants have logged more than 50,000 walk, bike, carpool, van pool, transit, and telecommute trips in that platform, saving over 76 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions um, and saving nearly 100,000 in commuting time. So this chart that's on the screen in front of you essentially shows the new registrations by um, in a timeline. And if you look at the early portions in December through January, February, March of 2020 is when the city of Santa Cruz announced their uh, downtown launch of the program in a pilot version. And then you look into March 2021, 
in this area. And that is when COVID hit and when um, people began working remotely, taking less transit, taking uh, less commutes and most people uh, who were office-based workers for the most part um, did a rapid shift to remote work and telework. Um, and then you'll see in February, or excuse me, in March, April, May of 2021 is when we launched the, or made the announcement for the countywide expansion. Um, we had still, it was still during the pandemic and it was, uh, we had minimal increases in enrollment. However, when we launched our participation with the University of Santa Cruz um, and got them on board, we saw our membership and our enrollment increase as well as the uh, participation for our users logging membership. So as I've, as I've alluded to in some of the other slides here, we, we faced quite a considerable amount of challenges during the pandemic trying to launch this community program. Um, in particular, some of the usual community events that we go to that, that we attend um, were canceled or postponed. Uh, two of the major events, uh, for example, where open streets, uh, both open streets events in Washingtonville and uh, Santa Cruz were canceled, as well as the bike to work uh, activities that were canceled last March, or excuse me, last May. Those, those events were um, re reconfigured to, to support any trip, uh, any, any bike trip. Um, and so we participated in the outreach with those. Um, and then also another challenge that we faced were that our commute rewards were an insufficient um, incentive to get new users to participate and to keep participating. Um, and that tracks also with our low participation rate. Um, we've had quite a few new users continue to join and, uh, and our enrollment is continuing to go up, but we're not seeing the, the level of trip logging that we would like. And that, lo that likely has to do with um, in, uh, folks are, are required to register on our platform to, re to attend our commuter workshops and other activities, but they don't necessarily have to log trips to earn those rewards. Um, and so we're working on improving our incentive offerings this, this coming year to, to track a bit more of the trip logging uh, requirements that go with the incentive. We also, the other issue we have is uh, getting more employers on board in our program and, and working with them. Um, we had a lot of employers who were focused on other, uh, other things uh, during the pandemic and uh, so enrolling in one of our voluntary programs wasn't uh, the highest of priority. However, we found that um, most of those calls have been postponed and many are calling back currently and scheduling uh, employer workshops and consultations uh, in the coming months. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, we also just limited our outreach um, and promotions uh, regarding ride share encouragement. So um, any promotions that dealt with um, carpooling, taking transit, uh, we really paused those um, to kind of comply with uh, social distancing and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so as I mentioned, so we do have a couple of upcoming activities that uh, we're hopeful in that this year will uh, improve our overall impact in the program. Um, we'll hope and um, we hope to partner with more employers, increase our presence at community events and offering a more robust uh, menu of incentives for uh, for commuters to try alternative modes of transportation. Um, today, we our staff are going are attending the Pajaro Business Expo and job and job fair in Washingtonville, um, promoting our program as well as RTC programs. Uh, and then coming up in May, we have Bike Month, which we call it the Action, so we'll be participating in those events as well, and, and have a bonus commute rewards for participants who log their bike trips during the month of May as well. And then in June, we'll be coming out with uh, our more enhanced uh, commuter benefits rollout um, with uh, additional incentives for carpooling, biking, taking transit, and so forth. And then uh, in the coming, coming weeks, we also have some um, commuter workshops scheduled with employers who are, who are in the process of onboarding. And that's, uh, we have an intro to e-bikes at Poly or Plant Time. Um, we have another uh, workshop coming up with the County of Santa Cruz and with the City of Watsonville. And we're currently in the process of onboarding the Seaside Company into our Go Santa Cruz Online platform. 
And then so finally, uh, the last item on my presentation is uh, the staff recommendations. Uh, we've been using the, the Right Amigos platform to, to host the benefits and the resources that we make available for so Go Santa Cruz County. And uh, Right Amigos, as I mentioned previously, is the underlying uh, software, software provider for this platform. Um, our current contract with them ends in, in June, and um, the staff recommendation is to have the RTC approve the resolution authorizing the executive director to extend this agreement. With that being said, um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any of your questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Naranjo, for the thorough uh, progress report and uh, overview of what's happening with Go Santa Cruz County for all of your work. Uh, I see hands up uh, from commissioners. I'll call first on Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Amy, for that uh, presentation. I've been supportive of the 511 program from the start. And uh, I think you're on the right track on your outreach efforts and so forth. And then COVID hit and messed everything up like everything else. But is, and we have uh, at the high point, we had uh, 2,700 uh, participants. Um, is, that, is there any comparable data how well we were doing? Certainly you've made the effort to reach out. So I just wanted to uh, find out if you had any, uh, is, is there any comparable data of other uh, commissions, organizations that have tried this? Uh, you seem like you've done a good job of outreach, but I just want to get a, a, a sense of how well or not so well we're doing for one reason or another. Um, right. I, I don't have the information readily available. However, in, in the research that we have done in other comparable programs, um, we found similar, I guess, trends as far as uh, participation in, in the platform and in ride sharing, commuting, carpooling, and so forth. Um, but the, the programs themselves that, we, that we've looked at as far as in the Bay Area and other areas um, are much more heavily resourced and heavily staffed um, with multiple uh, participating agencies uh, in, in the Bay Area, their programs are are, are required or mandatory, as well as um, they have a joint powers association that handles all of this. So we have essentially two staff in our office working on this program, and um, and and then our partners that we that we partner with uh, as far as consult uh, consultants. Um, but I can I can get that other additional information. Yeah. Well, thank you for your efforts and uh, your outreach efforts. Um, it, it's really thorough. So. Um, hope we can get more participants, uh, but uh, thank you for the work you're doing with the limited staff that, you, well, it's you, I guess, but uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Naranjo, for the, the great comprehensive pre presentation. I'm kind of building on what Supervisor or uh, Commissioner McPherson asked. Um, you mentioned there's a discrepancy between total users who have signed up and, and um, you know, monthly active users, people who are actually logging in to use the platform. Um, about how many active users are we seeing? Um, we're seeing probably between 150 to maybe 200 users a month who are actively logging their trips. Um, and so we're working on trying to figure out what, what additional efforts we can do on our side to continue uh, getting those uh, to getting users to log their trips, and 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 a big portion of those trips that are the users that have come in have come in uh, either through the downtown program who are getting their free transit passes. Um, the the downtown program doesn't have a requirement to to log transit trips to continue uh, receiving the free transit pass. Um, so in, in our current efforts as we move forward, we want to have some of those other requirements set in place so that. Our users are participating both ways, that they're logging their trip and for and for the effort of logging their trip will provide additional uh, rewards and benefits. Okay, thank you. And then uh, you mentioned that carpool and bandpool matches is, is rolling out. So those, those haven't been tried yet on the software or, or have they? They're currently, they currently are available. Uh, the new features that we are adding are uh, transit pool and walk pool options. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if, if someone is willing to take transit uh, to try that new commute, um, they can create a, a carpool or a transit buddy to take that route and, and try that new, that new mode. Okay, and do you know how many um, 
you know, carpool or vanpool matches have been made or are being actively uh, used? Um, I don't have that at the moment, but I can get that info for you um, maybe before this meeting is over. Okay. Um, and then I noticed that the Go Santa Cruz, I think it's the downtown program specifically, uh, was offering uh, bike e-bike rebates. Do you know how many folks have taken advantage of that program? Yeah. Um, the, the last I checked, there has been 74 applications that have been submitted uh, for that e-bait program. Okay, that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the, the program and I think it's really timely, right? I mean, as we see gas prices rising and, um, you know, unsustainable transit having a real impact on people's bottom line, people are looking for alternatives. And so I think, you know, this, this program is, is well-timed uh, and suited to the moment. Um, I did have a chance to download the Ride Amigos app and use it a little bit. And um, I mean, it works well, actually surprisingly well. It, you know, it syncs, it knows when I've moved and, and logs a trip um, or, or records the trip and then I have to click a button to log it. But nevertheless, there's some amount of automation there, which is impressive. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's just creating more, um, you know, it's just one more thing that people need to do. I mean, I don't see it as, as making the activity of getting on a bike or taking transit actually easier, right? I mean, if anything, you're asking now that person to, to change their behavior and log it on the app. And I think that's represented in the active users that we're seeing for the application. I mean, around 6% of all the signups are 158 people a month of 2,700 that have signed up. And so, um, I, you know, while I, I, I'm certainly optimistic for the program as a whole, but I'm not sure that we're going to see significant changes in that kind of usage for, for the Ride Amigos app uh, as, as, you know, functionally good as it is. I don't know that it's actually the right product to get people to mode shift. Um, I'm, you know, and he, as I said, we're at this really critical time where, where gas prices are really eat, eating into people's monthly budget. You know, I'd actually like to see us not renew the contract with Ride Amigos and take all that money and put it into more e-bike uh, rebates and scooter rebates. I, I mean, I don't think we're giving out rebates for scooters right now, but you know, the average e-bike cost, entry level e-bike costs 700 bucks at least. Entry level scooter costs 200 bucks. Um, and um, I mean, let's get, you know, even if it, we took, you know, uh, this, I think 69,000 over the next year or two, uh, that we're asking for for this app. I mean, that's $690, $100 rebates we can give to people um, to, to use the new complete streets in Watsonville or, you know, help people get around Live Oak. And, and that'll have a real impact uh, on people's monthly budget. So um, that's that's really where I'd like to see this program go. And I know that there's, um, you know, three, uh, 3CE, the Central Coast Community Energy is also giving out e-bike rebates. Um, and probably ultimately they'll have a bigger pool of, of money to apply to this, but maybe we can also collaborate with them and um, and help, you know, get get more people to apply for those rebates, make the process easier, streamline it, and just get more of these light electric vehicles, these e-bikes and scooters into people's hands so uh, they can see a real difference in their lives every day. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Koenig. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Thank you, Chair. Um, simple question. The um, app partner, the Software Amigos program, uh, they must be running other programs and I don't know. So in a sense, it depends if they are, which I assume they are. Um, do they have comparable stats that sort of uh, give us a better idea of how our program is doing relative to other situations, factoring in population and such like that so we could get a better comparable? You're right. Um, Bright Amigos is is the software solution that I would think up and down California is uh, they provide that. And and recently um, um, they're they're partnered with the entire Bay Area as well as the Monterey County and Central Coast. Um, so the, the platform is being used throughout all of these uh, all of these areas. And I can reach out to our contract, uh, our our vendor, and and get an idea of what other programs are doing and, and how their their usage compares to our usage. 
Thank you very much. Yes, and learning what they have learned to lead to success. And ultimately, as the last speaker, uh, Monty spoke about the ultimate here is to get more people on bikes. And um, I commuted from San Francisco on SB and took my bike to the rail station. I would have welcomed a program like this. Thank you. So um, I, I wanna, Commissioner Rock, and I see your hand, but I do see that uh, Deputy Director Mendez has a hand up and perhaps that's a response directly to the discussion that we're having. So I wanna call on you, uh, Mr. Mendez. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add a little bit to what uh, uh, Ms. Naranjo uh, communicated. Uh, when, we in, when we entered into the um, agreement by, by me, it was, I mean, there, there was actually a, a, quite a period of time that we were looking at various different uh, potential um, uh, partners for, for that effort. There were other, other companies uh, trying to provide similar uh, types of services for you know, managing um, uh, uh, services provided through, through community programs. Um, and basically, Red Amigos, in a sense, became really the only one available uh, for that because party, you know, their product was, was very good uh, com compared to others. As um, Commissioner Coney mentioned, it, it works actually quite well, even though it's not perfect uh, like, like anything. And so basically, their product became you know, the, the one that, that, that was really the best product out there. And, and certainly, yes, there were other. Uh, agencies throughout California already using Red Amigos. Some had actually started with other um, uh, uh, programs, but then you know, changed uh, over to Red Amigos. Uh, and then, as uh, Mr. Aqua uh, said, you know, Bay Area, then also shortly after um, uh, we entered the contract, Red Amigos, they were also adopted as the, as the program uh, and, and software to be used in, in the entire San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in a sense, they're kind of like, you know, I, I suppose we could um, research to see if there are others out there that had go, come out since we started Red Amigos, but my guess is most likely not, uh, you know, given the whole like, COVID situation that we had over the last couple of years, so I expect Red Amigos is really the only um, program out there. Thank you for sharing that additional context for us. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin. I just wanted to add that you know, when the city of Santa Cruz made its decision to uh, provide this a program like this uh, for people who work downtown, including city employees, um, I, I was amazed at how much a difference the incentives made. I, I didn't, you know, I almost didn't believe it when I first saw the numbers. I thought, really? I mean, the, the real reason for taking alternatives is it's better for your health, probably, than <laughs> what you're doing, or certainly better for the environment that it happens, and it saves you money in a significant way. And that was not apparently the biggest motive, but when they introduced the incentives of 20, you know, you get in a raffle where you might win a bicycle or, you know, $25 gift certificate or something, the, the participation just shot up like crazy. And I know the downtown program has had its issues and I don't want to get into that in any detail now, but I do think that experimenting with the issue with, with our uh, consultant there, um, uh, the Amigos group, if to look at the question of what kind of incentives are being used because as I said, I was just astounded that it made such a big difference that, you know, people, the chance of winning something or a small you know, token amount of money. If you look at the city of Santa Cruz, which has, I, I think, seven, 800 employees, something like that, and 200, 200 plus people are participating out of that workforce. So a big issue here as well is, is trying to get more employers involved, because once you get the employer involved and they do presentations to their group of employees, and we have some large, you know, relatively speaking, large employers, um, that can really make a difference here. So I think that's really worth investigating in the current period. And um, sort of this partly response to Manu's earlier comment, you know, whereas I also agree that it's great to get people bicycles, it makes a difference. I took advantage of the RTCs program years ago and got half the price off on an electric bike. Um, but, but I do think that the getting people ride share arrangements and giving them incentives and having an actual program that the employer promotes makes a much bigger difference than I would have thought it did. And so that's really something that I think our, our staff should be looking into. And I appreciate that this program does make a difference. I was skeptical. I, I shared Randy Johnson's earlier comments about a year ago. <clears throat> what is this, is there really bang for the buck here? Is, wouldn't this money be better just to subsidy to the transit district or buy new bicycles or whatever? But I think this, this program actually has some real promise 
It just needs to be followed up on and it can make a really big, again, in the past. And a big problem with this program right now is the COVID issue. I mean, that's why it's not taking off. I think it'd be doing a lot better if it weren't for the fact that people are still telecommuting or not necessarily going to work and the employment numbers are down. So we shouldn't be surprised that the numbers are not you know, jumping up in the way that they otherwise might be doing if it weren't for COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, sort of a follow-up to, um, you know, a question that emerges from Mike's comments is, do we know whether the people who are actively logging trips were, were let's just use biking or uh, as an example, were they biking before, uh, you know, do we know, we know someone's activity before they use the app versus afterwards so that you can know if those are new bike riders or simply people who ride their bike anyway but have started logging the activity because they can now get a $25 gift card for something they're already doing. We don't have that information available. Um, we, we do have some surveys um, that uh, survey tools that we can use to actually to measure that. And uh, we're in the process of getting that, that enhanced survey tool uh, set up is part of our spring release product release that's coming uh, for the Red Amigos platform. Um, but really, we what we try to do is in, in this early phase is just to get people on board, get them aware of the program, get them aware of how it works, and then this next coming phase uh, during this past year or during this coming year is going to be um, putting out the pre-survey um, and then tracking their their behavior during the year with the with the additional incentives that we're providing, and then uh, measuring how measuring our impact or our success um, in the following year. Okay, yeah, because I mean, that, that's my primary concern. I mean, it's, as I said, it's relatively easy for me to sign up for the platform and record my rides, but I'm already doing those rides. I, you know, I don't, and it, and it doesn't really impact my bottom line. I, I, um, I, I'm more concerned about someone who, you know, maybe they don't have a regular employer and, and and it isn't hearing about this program through their employer and they're not, you know, they're driving today and they're, you know, they're, they're not gonna mode shift because of an app and, and all this extra effort it's taking to track people's behavior. So. You know, that's why uh, I'm more for trying to just target that transition point and, and lowering the, the barriers for people. Okay, I will now take it out to the public for comments and then we'll come back uh, to the commission. It looks, we've had quite a few comments already, but we'll come back for deliberation and action. Um, okay, I, and I see um, Sally Arnold, you are up. Thanks. Am I unmuted? You are. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank Commissioner Bertrand for doing such a nice job of explaining how well bikes and rail work together to help people get out of their cars and expand their range in ways that, you know, just a bike alone could not do for them. And I also... On, on this program, um, like Ms. like uh, Commissioner Rotkin, I, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised that the external incentives are so motivating for some people. Um, but I also want to uh, point out that the best way to get people to shift away from their private cars is to provide a convenient alternative, something that is actually superior to the private car option. And if we had like a dedicated corridor where we could run some kind of tra time certain transit that was not in the with the um, with the cars or the buses, and that would allow like bring their bikes on it so their first mile last mile problems were solved. Could really lure people out of their cars, and the UCIF by adding a, a, some kind of transit system like that. Um, it's called light rail. Uh, to our system, we could increase our public transportation ridership by 150%. That would in also include additions to metro ridership. And so um, this app it sounds really interesting, and I'm really glad people are using it. And, um, and let's remember that just exhorting people to leave their cars behind is insufficient. We need to provide them with an actual convenient, realistic alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. Uh, let's see. Next up, David loves public transit. Your turn.
Mr. Van Brink, you can begin. I, I just got the unmute button. Am I uh, am I live? You are. Okay, so believe it or not, I'm not going to uh, talk about trains. Um, encouraging public transit uptake, or uh, really, you know, anything to reduce car usage is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot of great work on this area, and, and of course you have to prioritize because, you know, we can't do everything. But uh, transportation and climate management are very related. So, you know, that said, an area I wonder about is encouraging uptake among, uh, I'll just say it, uh, encouraging uptake among relatively affluent users. Over here on the west side, we benefit from uh, UCSC's uh, excellent uh, uh, Santa Cruz Metro coverage. Um, the Route 18 started less than a year ago, and I myself have radically increased my bus and bus plus bike usage. Uh, the 18 route runs every half hour into the night. It goes, you know, basically from my home to a Safeway into downtown. Uh, sometimes I like to cheat and, you know, bike down the hill and take uh, one of the buses back up the hill. So uh, I've got no data, but I really feel like there's an opportunity you know, with some outreach to make uh, public transit more mainstream and acceptable to, and again, I'll just say it, affluent people who largely rarely consider it. You know, we, we can't do everything. We have to prioritize. It's all very resource constrained, but I wanted to put that idea out there, both for Go Santa Cruz and for the commission in general. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. Our next speaker is Lonnie Faulkner. And you are on mute. Hi, thanks. I just saw that come up now. I uh, just want to get on the same train along with um, the last two speakers, Sally and David. Um, unfortunately, Sally's um, voice kept breaking in and out, but I wanted to support that as Mr. Bertrand noted, and so um, true that bikes and rail go hand in hand. This is seen throughout the world, like with Biddy B, if you um, look that up online, um, these two forms of transportation are uh, very, very well suited with each other. But I also wanna point out that, um, as Sally mentioned, as we bring funds in for electric light rail, this would also bring in funds for our bus metro system. And in order to serve our public and ensure that more people get out of their cars and into public transportation, we can go back to 2018 when Jared uh, Walker came, he's a transit expert, and he talked about how in order to get people out of their cars, we have to provide robust public transportation that people can access every 15 minutes. And in order to do that, we will need more buses. We will need light rail. We'll need um, as many options as possible. And then this wonderful program that allows people to access both buses and rail by their bikes. And as a cyclist myself, um, really value that relationship of bikes, rail, and buses together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Okay, I will now bring it back to the commission for deliberation and action. Move the staff recommendation. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second uh, on the staff recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Koenig, you're up. I would like to make a substitute motion. Um, as I said, I'm not ready to approve, uh, you know, this significant expenditure for Ryan Amigos today. Um, so I'd suggest that we come, that staff come back before June when the contract actually expires uh, with more information about daily active users on Ride Amigos in other communities, including carpools formed, and what an alternative Go Santa Cruz County program without Ride Amigos and more money available for e-bike and scooter rebates could look like. Okay, is there a second for the substitute motion? I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to consider a substitute motion. Uh, we now will, uh, Commissioner Rockin, I see your hand. I just want to explain the process. Sure. Um, so we will now uh, vote. We'll, we can discuss whether or not to accept the substitute motion, um, just whether or not to accept the substitute motion. At that point, if the motion is accepted, we will discuss that motion. And um, if it is not accepted, we will return to 
the original motion for discussion. So please limit your comments uh, to that piece of the process. Uh, Commissioner Ratkin. I just, my feeling is that this is not a good time when we're still uh, facing the significant impacts of COVID to sort of uh, change horses in this midstream. And so, whereas I'm not against the idea of studying the alternatives as um, uh, Director Koenig has suggested, I don't think this is the time to do it. I think we should proceed with the current program as recommended by staff. And then, uh, you know, next year, perhaps when we have more normal data about people using how their people are getting around on their way to work and so forth, and we have a more uh, traditional profile, it might be a time to consider his alternative idea. So I, I'm against a substitute motion. I want to go back to the main motion. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Yeah, my question is of Amy. Um, so based on the request from Manu uh, to provide more information, I'm, I'm sure you are in agreement that the board needs more information when they're making decisions, but do you have the time? Would this be something you could prepare in time so we can make a decision whether or not to continue the contract with Domingos? I believe there may be time. Um, we may have to, uh, depending on the timeline, we may have to do um, just a minor uh, contract amendment um, while we'll this goes through. Um, but what I should note though, is that this contract that, that we're moving forward with is also the same platform that the city of Santa Cruz uses in their entire program. Um, and so if we were to not renew this platform, that would also mean that this platform is no longer available to, uh, to UC Santa Cruz, who has a great number of active users, as well as uh, the city of Santa Cruz and their downtown program. And so we would all need to look for additional solutions for, um, for not only uh, our incentives and rewards program, but also carpool and ride pool matching. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, anything at that point set up uh, to provide those services. Um, thank you for that important information. Okay, Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, I have a question for Amy as well. This, the contract that we have, what are its termination procedure? Uh, what's the termination language? Uh, I believe uh, we can, well, we, we pay an annual licensing fee every year. Um, so when the license, when the, the contract ends, that means our, our licensing term ends, and then we just lose access to the platform. Um, so yeah. And then uh, I believe in our contract itself, I think we have a 90 day termination. Uh, if we cancel the agreement earlier than, uh, than our original agreement. Um, but I can check on the, the verification on that. To follow up, I, I want to ask Commissioner uh, Koenig if he would consider um, withdrawing his substitute motion if um, the, the motion, the main motion on the floor would add the questions that he wants asked, have that return at, uh, um, at the June meeting for consideration. We have an ongoing program to, you know, put it at risk uh, without any information, I think is, uh, would be unfortunate. I think the questions are worth, uh, are good questions, they're worth being answered. If the commission does decide that there are good reasons to terminate the contract, we at least would give uh, a time period for the um, for the commission to find an, an alternative approach if that's what they want to do. So rather than um, have you know uh, um, rather than put the current program at risk at this time. I, I would uh, request, if you're willing, to um, uh, uh, to uh, amend the motion that I made to approve the staff recommendation to add the questions that you uh, ra are raising and have that come back in the um, in the you know, at, at our June meeting. So, so to clarify, you're suggesting that we approve the contract today as per the staff recommendation, and then get more information um, in June after we've committed to another two years. 
I mean, my answer would be no. I don't, I don't see why we shouldn't get more information before making that commitment since we don't have to until June. And, um, you know, personally, I think a sick, I mean, uh, all of the people who will suffer from us not using this app, I mean, we're talking about 6% of uh, you know total people who've ever logged, who've ever signed up 158 people we could give out four times as many e-bike rebates with the same amount of money um so and, and i'm not asking that we make the decision to change the program completely today i'm just asking that we hold off and get a little bit more information and look at what an alternative could be well i think it really does put the program um at, at risk to create that level of uncertainty. Um, and um, I think our process is a weird process where we first accept the uh, substitute motion, then we vote on the substitute motion. I don't know why we do that. Um, I'm certainly willing to, uh, to vote on it. Uh, um, I, I won't be supporting it because I don't, you know, I think we ha have a program that's a difficult program to run, as, as Commissioner Rodkin said, particularly during a pandemic. Uh, it's important to have these kinds of alternatives uh, continue to be uh, supported by uh, the commission. As uh, Commissioner Koenig said, the uh, community energy uh, nonprofit is providing uh, incentives for electric bikes. So I don't think we're we're moving into an area that isn't already uh, covered. So I think we should move. We should continue to fund this program. Commissioner Johnson, I saw your hand was up, uh, but it lowered. Or did you have a comment? Well, I, I, I guess just uh, I want to compliment all the people. You know, Andy, Mike, and and also Manu in terms of um, thoughtful you know, consideration of this of this measure, um, because it's on the one hand, spending the people's money wisely is very, very important. On the other hand, continuing a program that has prospects and maybe, um, uh, you know, um, more capacity to improve is also important. But um, I like the fact that um, we're at least discussing this and not just kind of all of a sudden saying, yeah, that, that sounds good. Because I believe the total amount is somewhere around 250,000. Am I correct with, with everything that we're talking about? Uh, not, the, not the contract with um, the app provider, but uh, it's a lot of money. Um, and I know the goals are laudable, but we always, always have to keep a, an eye on the bottom line. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Yes. Um, so my original question was basically, can we learn from best practices across the uh, platform's users? And so, you know, I'm wondering if um, we could go for a one-year or a two-year contract, because I, I think there's some room here to take a look at our program and try to improve it in different ways. And I, I realize that COVID is rarely... <laughs> going to help us out in situations like this, but um, give us enough time in a year to look a little more closely so we could augment this. Um, in terms of the ride, no, excuse me, bike e, e, um, rebates and stuff like that, I would never, even though I'm retired, I earn enough on Social Security that I would not be able to get that. So, you know, if we're going to talk about giving out rebates to um, people who buy bikes, you know, we have the whole thing of what are the classifications and are the categories and stuff like that? So that's something you know we haven't even haven't started to talk about. So. Thank so you. So a year, and you know, can we take that time to take a better look at our program? I don't know. We have to have three years, basically. Commissioner Schifrin. I just wanted to clarify, based on um, Commissioner Johnson's. Um, uh, statement um, that the resolution that we're being asked to support is uh, to increase the total contract value by $77,150. Uh, so while the overall program, I think um, Commissioner uh, Johnson is probably right, might be um, um, $250,000, I'm not sure I understand all the details, 
this 77,000 contribution may be the way we leverage a much wider program. And uh, I agree with Commissioner Bertrand's comments about, you know, if we're going to get into the business of doing rebates for um, for e-bikes, and it may make sense to do that as a as an owner of a and a rider of an e-bike, I can certainly attest that they make a huge difference in terms of my being able to get around the city. But they're not for everybody, and they can really scare the heck out of you when you're driving on the street. So um, I think it does, you know, it does warrant some consideration. But this is a program that I think is an important program, and it's um, as we've seen over the years, getting people to do ride sharing is difficult. Uh, getting people to accept alternatives to driving their car everywhere is difficult, but we've got to keep struggling to do it because the consequences of not doing it are uh, really uh, negative. So I think, um, if, you know, I'm not going to support the substitute motion. Again, I'd offer Commissioner Conant the alternative of, you know, adding to the motion, the main motion on the floor, the questions he raised and have that come back and maybe with the consideration of the um, the commission getting involved in an e-bike rebate program um, for consideration. I think it's worth looking into, but I don't wanna hold this uh, program hostage for that option. I'd like to provide two, two clarifications, um, questions that were previously asked. Um, as far as the contract cancellation uh, language that we have, um, we are required to give 60 days notice uh, to the con or to the contractor if we'd like to cancel our agreement um, and not continue our services. Um, and then as far as the the resolution itself, so Right Amigos bills us annually um, and for our, our agreement and we pay annually. So the current budget has authorized us for the, the upcoming year. Um, and so there is the potential, should this not pass, we could um, not renew at, at, at the, the following year. Um, and let's see, um, the, yeah, so, so we do have the, the, the contract itself that it's just on an annual basis. And if we were to cancel in the middle of a contract term, we would essentially just lose out on the money that we've already paid for the, the annual license fee. And then the reason why we uh, we were bringing to the board a two-year extension is to try to prevent any additional price increases. And so to lock in this price versus having to have an additional pr uh, price increase the following year. Commissioner Bertrand. Yeah, so it was mentioned that the city of Santa Cruz uses this program. And I was wondering, would there be any detriment to the program overall in terms of I understand what um, <laughs> is being said here. We, we need to approve gradually, or excuse me, work gradually so we get a general acceptance on the public side. I totally agree with that. But if we just, just bagged, uh, bagged our program here, how would that influence the city of Santa Cruz's program? Do you have any idea? Maybe you don't work with them. Uh, we, we we coordinate together, yes. And um, they would have to find their own platform and a, and a new and a new tool to offer the downtown commuters um, any of these available resources and incentives. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the short of it. Um, and, and I think I mentioned previously that when we created this contract originally, the city of Santa Cruz uh, contributed 40,000 to our initial implementation cost of the program. And then as, as we continue building the program, they offer their set of incentives our TC, our, our program, the countywide program offers a, a, another set of incentives. Um, but we work together on all of our marketing and outreach programming and, and build off of both of our budgets to, uh, to try to get the biggest bang for our buck in this program. Well, thank you very much. That really helps me understand. I did not know we were joined with them. I thought we were standalone. So that really helps me. Um, but, you know, going back to Andy's um, comments earlier about trying to get this information out before we make a decision or be before June, you know, you know, Manu, I sort of agree with this idea. We, we need the information and, you know, maybe this will give us some more food for thought uh, if there is information that leads us in that direction. 
So in, in a sense, I'm not supporting this uh, alternate motion because I, I see this program as being quite well knit with other agencies, uh, Santa Cruz. And I do agree with the comments that to get generally accepted mode changes in the population is, is something that takes a lot of work. It's, I was involved in other traffic studies and once you make a, a motion, once you try to make a change, it is really difficult for the public to accept it. And I think this sort of falls in that venue. So I won't support the motion as well. Substitute motion. Sure. Yeah, just a couple of questions. So, Amy, you said if we cancel, we have 60 days, we have to provide 60 days notice to terminate, which I assume then is any day now if it's, if it's, any, if it's in early June. Is there a penalty if we are not within those 60 days or are we just like billed for the next year or how does that work? We get invoiced for the following year. Um, and so um, if we were to cancel, we would then, I think we would just lose access to our platform. And so we would need to, well, one, we would need to coordinate with the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, we'd need to coordinate with our marketing and outreach efforts. Um, uh, last month, uh, the board approved our additional contract with, uh, with Miller Maxfield and Ecology Action to continue uh, the marketing uh, consultant services as well as the employer outreach services with those um, with those consultants. So we would have to terminate those contracts as well um, and and or revise our our contract and our scope of work to to something else that has yet to be determined. Right, right. And just to clarify, I'm not proposing that we cancel the program or cancel our contracts with marketing. I'm simply suggesting that maybe the content of the program needs to change. The other question is, if we agree to a two-year, if we approve this two-year contract today, you're saying to lock in the pricing, mm -hmm. uh, we could still have the same discussion next year and choose to cancel the contract without penalty. Is that correct? Right, right, because we're billed annually. And okay. so so uh, with our contract extension uh, going into the following year, the new contract will start at the beginning of the fiscal year, and that'll go through uh, end of or end of the fiscal 20, I don't know, June 2023. Um, and then uh, they'll send us another invoice. And at that point, if, if there's if there's been something that a termination has been made, um, we could provide the 60 days notice and work with the city of Santa Cruz that we're not going to uh, extend another year uh, with, with Right Amigos potentially. Commissioner Parker. Thank you. I'm interested, um, uh, Amy, also, I, I'm really just interested in a lot of information. So I'm interested in, in the fact that have the other cities in the county of Santa Cruz uh, been able to access, access this partnership like you're talking about with the city of Santa Cruz? Um, and uh, has that come on board? Has that been offered? Is that a discussion? Is that something we can look into and see if that's a viable? Because we're moving as many of the commissioners have said, from a pandemic status, trying to get you know people back and moving on the bus, um, and and I'm really interested in seeing how that works in a broader sense. So the information um, that the Supervisor um, uh, Manu asked for, I that's what I'm looking at. I think it's really important, and that's why I seconded this motion. I just think it, there may be other ways in which we could utilize this program um, than what we've done now. And of course, you know, it's because it's hopefully becoming post-pandemic, you know, versus uh, we're just starting the whole circus again. Thank you very much, Amy, though, for your report. Appreciate it. Yeah, the, thank you for the for the question there. Um, as you guys mentioned earlier, and some of the challenges that we've had was was connecting with major employers and signing them up. So when we started the program and in, in our early in our early development, it was having the city of Santa Cruz taking the lead on the initial pilot program of 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 this uh, of the Go Santa Cruz platform, and then also working with our partners at Ecology Action and at the University of Santa Cruz to to, to test out the program to see what's working, what doesn't work to test out the, the tools that are available in the platform for employers and just kind of fine tuning that. And then the city of Santa Cruz did their initial launch and we were supposed to launch our countywide program a couple of months after, but we delayed that um, due to COVID. Um, and so our, our efforts as we're moving forward and activities that we have planned currently 
are to actually do or to provide the major employer. So we're trying to get on board with the, the, the county of Santa Cruz, uh, with the city of Watsonville, and some of the other cities and other jurisdictions to get their employees on board to, to provide a similar presentation like this to, to employees and their staff and working with, um, with the, the organization's lead contact. Um, we found that was challenging during the pandemic and during, and during the last year is that there was, there was little interest because employers were faced with the uncertainties of what are, what are they doing with their employees? Uh, are they bringing people back? Are they, are they, are they focusing on a hybrid work policy? Are people coming back? Um, and all these other uncertainties or any you know, increased workload, um, people losing their jobs, people transitioning to other jobs, moving out and so forth. And so anyhow, um, that's what we're saying. We're, we're really hopeful that we can get these other larger employers on board. And we're hopeful of that because we have these uh, activities currently planned with them. And, and, and uh, employers are actually being a little bit more responsive now in, in connecting back with us to, to reach out for these services. Commissioner Koenig. Okay, well, thank, thank you. I, I hear that you know, you're, you're eager to get a year of runtime on this, first of all, post-pandemic, and second of all, that there, might, that there would be penalties if we, that we don't actually have two months before the contract expires to receive more information because um, there, essentially there'll be penalties, and if we don't cancel within 60 days, we'll still be billed for next year anyway. So I'm willing to withdraw the motion if um, you know, the maker of the main motion would add that um, we are going to review this in a year's time rather than just roll this into a, into two years. Um, I'm willing to do that. I, I'm willing to uh, amend the motion if it's okay with uh, uh, the person who's second. Uh, and that's that's me. It's, it's fine with the second. Um, to um, direct staff to provide the information that, that you've, re you've requested. Okay, thank you. Then I will draw uh, my substitute motion. And as a second, uh, if I have to say anything, I'm I'm fine with that as well. Thank you. Do. You. you do. Thanks, sir. Yes, <laughs> I was just going to ask. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so we are. Thank you for the uh, lively uh, discussion, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Koenig and and Parker for um, reconsidering. So we can just take the motion that is on the floor, which is the staff recommendation. I am going to make a comment here. Um, I think that this, and I'll try to reframe my comment in light of the withdrawal of the, the previous, the, the substitute motion. Um, th this program is, um, it's a relatively new program. As we've heard, the platform itself is functional um, and it works very well, which I think is, is in and of itself is a real um, coup for us. Um, we have a staff that's been working very hard um, and, you know, to try to make this, uh, this, the platform and the program functional, working with these larger employers has, as we know, been a challenge um, and um, it, it just takes time. These, these things take time. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz participation came as a result of the city council supporting this approach and um, and really as a, as a partner agency, but also as an employer being involved. And so um, I'd like to just offer up and ask uh, Amy, Ms. Naranjo, and, and um, anybody from our staff, if you have thoughts on ways that we can help.
I'm reaching out to them right now. Wonderful, thank you. I don't know if my comments need to be recorded for posterity. I'll just finish them. <laughs> um, so, recording in progress. I um, thank you. So we are recording again. Um, so you know, I, from my perspective, it's a it's a relatively small investment for, and and there's a whole lot of potential in it. Um, with respect to the question of whether or not these funds might be used uh, more effectively, for example, for um, incentives. I want to use that opportunity to mention that in addition to the 3CE, Central Coast Community Energy Incentives, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District also offers incentives. And we have had, I'm, I, I serve on that uh, board, we have had difficulties actually expending the funds because there has been low, um, you know, a sm small number of applicants. So we have worked to revise the qualifications and you know what it takes to actually demonstrate uh, income eligibility to, in order to raise that. So there are funds out there available for people who want e-bikes. Um, and you know the the idea of the RTC, I'm not opposed to the RTC considering <clears throat> something like that, but the administration of that kind of program, that also takes staff time and and um, you know there's a cost to that as well. So given that there are, uh, you know, other incentives out there, probably more coming uh, with changes in kind of the state and federal approach to transit transportation policy, I think our efforts are kind of better spent on this and our resources on this co coordination uh, um, program. So um, I guess with that, I've, I've been wanting well, to- Well, let me just clarify if time. I could- Yes, um, please. That what the motion is. Yes, please. The motion is to approve the staff recommendation with an additional direction to staff to return uh, at, with the information that was requested by Commissioner uh, Koenig. Yes. Um, is that yes. sufficient? I didn't get all your words right. So I want to make sure that, I, would be like, that, like that, 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 that the motion is clear on what that additional information request is. Yeah, that, I think that's sufficient. I mean, and also to return at this time next year before we go and roll into the second year of the contract uh, for a review. Correct. Okay. Good. I just wanted to make the, be clear that 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 the motion included that additional direction. All the questions. Okay. Um, so I will stop talking then. It sounds like people want me to stop talking. So call the question. I don't. I don't think we need a vote on calling the question. I'll just um, call. No, exactly. That, that was that was my suggestion. <laughs> yeah. Let's just call the vote. Um, I'll I'll, I'll uh, share more thoughts on it uh, when it comes back around. So we'll we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote now. Commissioner Bertrand. I agree. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate uh, Hurst? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Yes. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes unanimously. We are moving on now to our uh, last regular item before we go into closed session. And that is uh, the proposed budget for uh, fiscal year 2022-23. This is item 24 on our agenda. And we will return to uh, Tracy New, our Director of Budget and Finance, and <laughs> Luis Mendez, Deputy Director. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, good morning, Tracy New of RTC staff presenting the first 2022-23 proposed budget. This budget is presented early to allow the RTC to inform claimants of projected apportionments of Transportation Development Act funds and pro projected Measure D funds for use in developing their budgets. Revenue estimates for the new fiscal year include TDA um, revenues from the County Auditor, state transit assistance and state of good repair from the state controller's office and measure D from HDL companies. RTC maintains an 8% reserve for TDA and is responsible for administration and allocation of revenues to eligible claimants based on a formula share. The RTC is also responsible for the allocation of state transit assistance and state of good repair revenues. 
actual Measure D revenues received each month are distributed in accordance with the Ordinance Expenditure Plan. Presented to this commission is the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Program and project revenues and expenditures are based on the estimates for work to be completed in the coming fiscal year and meet the TDA and RTC operations cash, cash flow reserve targets. The proposed staff budget includes 132,328 for additional payments toward the pension unfunded accrued liability and $62,290 to establish a pension section 115 trust for a total of $194,618 and $81,972 to establish a Calvary section 115 trust for retiree health benefits. In June, staff will prepare an amendment to the budget based on actual spending to determine the carryover of revenues and expenditures based on work completed. The Budget and Administration Personnel Committee and staff recommend that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission adopt a resolution approving the fiscal year 22-23 RTC and Measure D budgets as shown on Exhibit A, Attachment 1 accept the Transportation Development Act revenue forecast for fiscal year 22-23, accept the Measure D revenue forecast for fiscal year 22-23, accept the 30-year Measure D revenue projection, accept the five-year Measure D revenue estimates, as well as adopt a resolution authorizing the Executive Director to sign the California Employers Pension Prefunding Trust Program Agreement and Election to prefund the employer contributions certification of funding policy and delegation of authority to request disbursements. And lastly, adopt a resolution authorizing the executive director to sign the agreement and election to prefund other post-employment benefits through CalPERS, certification of funding policy and delegation of authority to request disbursements. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Um, I just want to apologize for not having my screen on. I'm I have limited connectivity, so it just helps to not freeze up. Um, but I am here, and I will see if there are members of the commission who have questions for Ms. New. Okay. Seeing none. Uh, any members of the public? Commissioner Johnson, I'll come right back around to you. Any members of the public who would like to speak on the budget? Okay, um, seeing none, uh, Commissioner Randy Johnson. Well, just real quick, and it's it's been a while since I visited this. There is a small discrepancy in terms, I, I know a lot of the funds that are distributed are, are based on population. And maybe three or four or five years ago, um, after 20 years of, of capital and Scotts Valley being exactly uh, equal in terms of um, monies distributed, they crept they crept a little bit ahead of us. I think based on sales tax considerations, you know, even though we have twice the um, the square mileage, and I think maybe 10 to 15 percent more population. I just want to look at that. You know, it's not a lot of money, uh, but I but you know, a big part of <laughs> Uh, what we do here is uh, in terms of equity. And I just wanted to kind of revisit that to make sure that, uh, um, you know, that, you know, everybody gets their fair share based on population. So uh, I would have to be reminded of where those monies come from, but uh, maybe you, maybe um, staff can do that for us. Thanks. I would be happy to send that information and the percentage um, that's allocated for each type, which is the road miles the sales tax generation in the county, as well as uh, population numbers. I'll send that out. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Rockin. Should I wait for the public for a month before we get a motion? I took it out to the public. Okay, and... then I'll, I'll move that we approve the staff recommendation for, it's basically claim purposes or to letting the, it's not as preliminary budget, and I'll move its approval. And I will uh, ask that the questions that uh, Randy Johnson asked be answered before we get back to the final budget, so everybody's clear on how the. I'll uh, second the motion uh, with the understanding the that it that it includes uh, all seven recommendations, staff recommendations. Yeah. Yes, that's the intent of the motion. Okay, Commissioner Bertrand. Being that Andy is going to get some 
Randy's going to get some information that concerns Capitola. I'd like a copy of that too. I think we'll all like to see that. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll just keep we'll keep monitoring you guys. <laughs> and I'll provide you with the sources where we get the information. Yeah, it was half in jest. I, I know this is a big issue, and um, our city managers are constantly working on it. So uh, it's it hasn't it hasn't gone away for a long time. Hey. So, I call, call the motion. Call the, call the question. Okay. Um, question. Every time I open my mouth, somebody else wants to talk, so I try to give it a moment. Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry Sandy. Go ahead. If you I, want I to say something, give a pause. you have a right to speak as well. <laughs> um, I like to make sure everybody is done. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and take a, a vote on, on the motion to approve the uh, preliminary budget. Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commission, uh, Commissioner Sandy Brown, sorry about that. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commission Alternate Hurst? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hernandez? Aye. Commission Alternate Schiffrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Yes. Commissioner Brocken? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, our last. Um, uh, could I just mm -hmm. clarify that this isn't, if I'm understanding it correctly, this isn't the preliminary budget. No. This is the budget. Or, yeah, so. Is that correct? I believe we have a final vote on this in June, though. So. No, I don't think so. I think it comes back in October uh, to be oh, okay. revised based on um, the, you know, the expenditures in the fiscal year. But I don't, we, as I understand it, that's why I wanted to clarify, we are not going to be voting on this again. This is our approval of the, and the reason that we do it is so the member agencies, particularly the transit district can base their budget, knowing that the commission has approved their allocations. Thanks for the clarification. That's correct. Anything to add? That, that is correct. It, it is commissions for fiscal year 2023 and we will come back for amendments um you know typically in the fall after we know the carryovers from this year as, as uh, uh your staff member uh, tracy you uh communicated you know in june we will come back with some information for the, uh, um, on the carryovers based on this fiscal year okay uh so that has I think we've now clarified the, the motion we have adopted is the uh, approval of the budget for fiscal 23 uh, and we will now move on to our final item is closed session and we have um, two items on the closed session agenda I'll ask our uh, RTC council if uh, to give us a um, sure. overview, and then it, whether or not we'll be uh, reporting out from closed session. You yeah, that? thank you, Madam Chair. We have two items on closed session. First, we have a labor negotiations, both for the mid management unit and the core units, and then secondly, we have a closed session related to potential litigation with significant exposure. Um, one case, and this relates uh, to. Uh, potential repairs um, near Manresa Beach to the to the um, right of way that RTC owns. And do you anticipate a report out? Um, I there there's a possibility of a report out, uh, but but I don't. We'll um, see the direction from the commission. Okay. Uh, so with that, we will adjourn the. Oh, I see another hand up. Commissioner Hurst, we will not adjourn. You're, you're muted. You're well, muted. Sorry again. I was just checking to see where the link was for the closed session. Is that a separate it, link? Yes, it just got sent to us this morning. You should find it in your inbox. Uh, who would that be from? Ian Barry. Barry. I'll look for it, but I don't see it. We'll send it to you again, Commissioner um, Hurst. We usually don't send it to um, alternates automatically unless we hear from the commissioner. So we'll get that out to you immediately. Thank you very much. 
You can make sure to send it to me too. I, I didn't see it before the meeting. Okay, well, did you make sure that is? I just wanted to clarify whether we need to hear from, if there's any members of the public who want to speak on the closed session items. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Uh, um, I don't see any hands up, but I will. Uh, I'll, I'll just put it out there. If, are there any members of the public who'd like to speak to items on our closed session agenda? Okay, seeing none, I will adjourn this meeting. We will now move into closed session and there is a link uh, for that. See you all soon. Okay, um, so we are, we've now returned to our open session agenda to report out on actions taken during closed session. I'll turn it over to Mattis, our RTC council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the commission had uh, two items on the closed session. There were no reportable actions from the labor negotiations items with regards to the um, potential litigation item. I'm reporting out that on a nine to zero vote, the commission uh, directed the executive director to not execute the contract for the erosion repair project at Manresa Beach. And that is the extent of the report out. Thank you. And I believe with that, we can officially adjourn today's meeting. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you at the transportation policy workshop. I believe that's our last item next meetings. Uh, and that will be the third Thursday, so 7th, 14th, 21st. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>